Since a few years, a long time, she lived in a small apartment when he arrived. He knocked on a door in the middle of the night. She opened and he entered, and that's it. She always loved the man, bigger than her. He was nearly small and smelled a wet grass. He said nothing to her, and no look on her. He told her. Casting in print, he has no tenderness ever. He takes all that she possesses. She quickly walks into a work every morning, put on the dress. 
was never to be outside And mon met to fit him Hey, the mon around And nobody anymore around her Last night he peaced on the Somebody's hurting me Witness over
a scarlet letter locked off into the night. We're approaching the wall or an opening gate to another fast life. All oh, witness of the sea. What is your price for driving faster and kill a slight in men's field? How much do I have to pay for you to refuel and push the accelerator? Mm-hmm. What is your price for?
Hello everyone. Welcome to the fourth edition of the Night of Ideas in Hong Kong, co-organized by the Consulate General of France and the Hong Kong Museum of Art. The Night of Ideas in Hong Kong is a part of a worldwide operation that aims to share the French culture of debate. It takes place every January with the support of the Institut Francais of Paris, from Seoul to Los Angeles, Tokyo to Paris, passing through Singapore, Hong Kong, and New York. More than 200 nights of ideas have already been organized in 90 countries and regions. Thinkers from across different disciplines propose their vision of the future and propose solutions to the challenges facing us in our contemporary societies. Issues related to, but not limited to, culture, equality, education, technology have been discussed. Tonight, we're going to explore the role of art and culture play in our contemporary societies, especially during these challenging times that we're living in. Can they bring us together, guide us through this historical chapter, and help us to restart, to start again? From now until 10, 15 p.m., leading French, Hong Kong, leading French and Hong Kong art professionals, experts, as well as renowned artists from Hong Kong and France will be sharing their insights. At 6.30 p.m., the opening conversation, the power of art. The power of art and culture. And to what extent art and culture can unite us in times of crisis and how it can help us revisit our perception of the world. At 7.30 p.m., the first panel discussion, museums at the crossroads of cultures and societies will explore in which ways museums are at the heart and crossroads of the great changes that our societies are facing at the moment. History has shown us that museums and institutions have constantly been reinventing themselves and reflecting the lives and the conditions that we're living in. What could be the new transitions that will emerge after this exceptional year? At 9.15 p.m., the second panel discussion, Art Post 2020, the digitalization of art, will explore the way artistic practices will evolve after 2020. Given the rapid development of new technologies and the increasing use of artificial intelligence. Every session will be followed by a Q&A, so please join us and submit your questions via Facebook. Just type in your questions in the comment section and we hope to hear from you. And please make sure do not miss out the break times because during the break times, we'll be showing a lot of exciting videos featuring the outstanding institutions and the works of art by the artists featured in tonight's event. So to start, we'll begin with the presentations from our two keynote speakers. First, may I invite Dr. Maria Mok, Director of the Hong Kong Museum of Art. Please. Thank you. 
Mr. Georgini, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Bonjour, good evening. It is my pleasure to coordinate this worldwide event, Night of Ideas, with the Consulate General of France in Hong Kong at the Hong Kong Museum of Art. In the past two decades, the Hong Kong Museum of Art has maintained long-term and close partnerships with the Consulate General of France in Hong Kong to bring quality exhibitions and programs to Hong Kong. Covering prominent artworks spanning 20th century's main movements, Chinese paintings and modern artworks created by world-renowned designers, architects, and artists. In 2021, we are delighted to have the privilege and honor to co-organize the fourth Hong Kong edition of the Night of Ideas. Last year was a challenging year to all museums and art institutions in the world, including the Hong Kong Museum of Art. As you would probably know, we have completed a four-year major renovation and reopened in November 2019. It was a moment when we were expected to show the audience our revamped identity. We put on 11 exhibitions revolving around four core pillars of Chinese antiquities, Chinese painting and calligraphy, China trade art, as well as modern and Hong Kong art to show how we aspire to refreshing ways of looking at art tradition and making art relevant to everyone, creating new experiences and understanding. But soon, we have been closed for multiple times during the year under the sweat of COVID-19. However, this was also an opportunity to show the influence of the virtual world and how we could ride on this to keep in touch with art lovers and the public. This event tonight, involving multiple city participation around the world, surely shows an example of engagement without physical barriers. In the Hong Kong edition, under the theme of Start Again, we are grateful to invite art professionals from France and Hong Kong, including curators and directors of the Musée d'Orsay, Palace of Exile, Musée Picasso, M Plus Museum, and the Hong Kong Heritage Museum, artists, cultural journalists, and art experts to this event to share their experiences and insights on the road of culture and art to the societies in a time of the pandemic. At the same time, colleagues and friends of the art world are welcome to watch the live recording of this event online. Going digital is a powerful and effective way to maintain presence while dealing with the inconveniences of lockdowns and social distancing measures. Although the site was closed, the HKMOA has taken the opportunity to drive innovation in extensive digital strategies and programs. Last March, we launched the digital platform virtually at HKMOA with an access to view our entire collection of 17,000 sets of exhibits and a diversity of programs reflecting the Hong Kong cultural legacy and making art more accessible to everybody. We have also been actively and continuously enhanced our sharing on the social media platforms to create new experiences to our visitors, aiming in sparking curiosity, online presence, and further audience growth when we reopen. I believe that the, there are many more exciting and innovative projects to be shared by participating speakers this evening. I would like to pay warm tribute to the Consulate General of France in Hong Kong for bringing the event to the museum. I would also like to thank the Institut Francais for your enormous support. My gratitude and appreciation, of course, also goes to all participating speakers for sharing your insights. Lastly, may I wish everybody good health and the event a great success. And I look forward to seeing you at the museum when it's safe to reopen again. Merci beaucoup, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria. Mm. And may I now invite our next keynote speaker, 
Mr. Alexander Giorgini, Consul General of France in Hong Kong. Bonsoir à tous. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to be here tonight in this iconic place uh, of Hong Kong. And I have to say that one of uh, the best moments I had during the last months in Hong Kong was the discovery of the wonderful Botticelli exhibition that you uh, organized, Maria. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, let, let's, let's begin directly. Uh, last Monday, I, I uh, checked the French news and I saw uh, two major uh, announcements in the cultural field. The first one, the Musée Carnavalet, Museum of Paris History, is to reopen uh, after four years of uh, renovation with uh, 1.5 kilometers of work. This is wonderful. Second news. Uh, the Centre Pompidou is to close for a four-year renovation. Good news also, <laughs> but it was not perceived as such by the French public. We, uh, as I checked, as I saw in, in the social networks, the reactions were mostly negative. How can you deprive the people from one of the most iconic places for uh, uh, art in Paris. Uh, how is it possible to uh, deprive uh, the visitors? So the French government had to uh, justify this decision. Do not worry, uh, we will keep all the staff. Do not worry, uh, we will organize, the Centre Pompidou will organize online events. Uh, do not worry, uh, the Centre Pompidou uh, will send its collections abroad uh, to uh, make other people and other countries discover uh, French art. Uh, as a French diplomat, of course, I was uh, wondering, is it the kind of reaction that you, you can have uh, elsewhere in the world, or is it a kind of typical French uh, madness on some reaction? I do not know. I, I, I do not have the, 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 the answer. But I think that this kind of reaction is somehow typical of uh, the COVID times. OK, we need a vaccine. OK, we need uh, economic recovery. OK, we need jobs. Plus, plus, we need to keep the access to education and culture. That's to say that something which is part of our human dignity. Health and food are for the animal part of the human being. But we need more because we are more. Um, now, why meeting uh, tonight and why this joint initiative of the Museum of Art and of the Consul General of France in Hong Kong and Macau? Uh, because I think we share uh, a common, uh, a common uh, uh, challenge. Our cultural institutions, museum, libraries, uh, musical institution, are today in a state of emergency. Uh, it's firstly a financial emergency. Uh, when the number, the number of lockdowns uh, in the world was at as its uh, its highest in May. Uh, 95% of the museums around the world were closed. And uh, I saw some statistics saying that uh, maybe 13% of the museums will never reopen and are at risk. And of course, the situation is particularly critical in France. Uh, no doubt uh, uh, on this. Imagine, because we have some French uh, uh, museums and heritage uh, uh, institutions rank among uh, the biggest and the most visited places in, in the world. For instance, the Louvre uh, museums uh, usually receives 10 million visitors per year. And unfortunately, in 2020, uh, French museums showed an average uh, decline of 70% uh, in its visitor, minus 70%. And for instance, for the castle of Versailles, it's minus 82%. So there is a real 
financial emergency. We are also facing a social emergency. Our soci societies, both in France and Hong Kong, are increasingly divided. And culture is a major driver for unity, inclusion, and social cohesion. It brings people closer, whatever their differences are. And in France, we, we, we have a, a strong tradition of uh, bringing people together through cultural initiative. Just one example. Um, during the first weekend of September, every year, we organize the Heritage Days. And for uh, this weekend, uh, all the museums uh, are open for free, and even monuments which are usually closed to the public. And even the presidential palace, the National Assembly, uh, are open to, to the public. And during the last edition before the COVID, uh, we had 12 million visitors during the weekend. So one French out of five. That means that these people, these 12 million people, they do not have the same political ideas. Some are rich, some are poor, but they come together and they attain the same event. And this is really uh, uh, wonderful. So what do we need now in, in, in COVID times? What we need, of course, is to be creative, to preserve, to save this access uh, uh, to culture, which is essential for our societies. So of course, we have in mind uh, digital, digitalization, uh, virtual exhibitions, podcasts, online concerts. Uh, we do it, you, you, you do it, and this is absolutely necessary. This is the future. But uh, the 100% digital may not be uh, the, the, the unique solution. So we have to keep uh, uh, over a kind of uh, initiatives. I think but we do not have the, the solution. You don't have the solution. But having tonight this frank uh, exchange of views and experiences for sure uh, may, may help us. So a great, great thank to Maria Merck, a great, great thank to uh, the Museum of Art, a great, great thank to uh, our uh, Hong Kong friends, to Hong Kong lovers of uh, art and uh, culture. Uh, Tonight, I think we will have a, a, a fascinating debate. And thank you to all uh, uh, the, the, the speakers, and especially, uh, of course, to the, the three uh, directors of uh, three French major cultural institutions. Uh, tonight, we will have uh, the director of the Louvre, of the, sorry, of the Castle of Versailles, of the Museum of Forsay, which is the Temple of Impressionism, and of the uh, Museum of uh, Picasso, the Picasso uh, Museum. Just before uh, we begin, I think a, a good news is that COVID will not prevail. <laughs> COVID will not prevail on us thanks to culture, thanks to culture. And uh, if circumstances allow, uh, I hope to come very often and very soon in this wonderful place, uh, the Museum of Art, for uh, new discoveries new discoveries of Hong Kong art, new discoveries, I hope also, of uh, French art. So we work together with our Hong Kong friends very, very hard uh, to propose to the public new things. So the COVID will not prevail. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Giorgini. And thank you, Dr. Maria Mark.
Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, so to begin with uh, the great program of tonight, uh, we have the opening conversation, The Power of Art. So in this session, we'll have two distinguished speakers, Mr. Johnson Chang, curator and Chinese contemporary art expert, and Ms. Le Hons de Car, president of Musée d'Orsay et de la Hongerie. Ms. Le Hons de Car, please. Well, thank you. Um, well, it's a, it's a good evening or a good day to everyone, uh, according to the place where you are in the world. Um, I am Laurence Descartes, I am the president of the uh, Musée d'Orsay and Musée de l'Orangerie in, in Paris, and I want to thank everyone for their kind invitation to join uh, the conversation today. Uh, we have a big subject ahead of us, the power of art, which is, um, you know, there's a lot to say ab about it. And I just wanted to have to make a little introduction, sorry, a little bit uh, on a personal side about uh, uh, my uh, professional um, journey, I would say. I am uh, an art historian. I, I was trained as an art historian in the uh, Sorbonne and Ecole du Louvre in Paris, specialist of the 19th century art, uh, especially French art of the 19th century. And uh, I started, um, as many curators, my, my career in my specialty here in Orsay many, many years ago. Uh, and I was very fortunate for uh, the first 15 years of my career to be able to curate numerous shows to work with international institutions, especially American ones. Um, and to do my job as an art historian uh, specialized in, um, in, uh, in, in the 19th century art and especially uh, painting. And then, um, you know, I was very fortunate to, um, um, to be trusted for a, a, a fantastic uh, cultural and diplomatic adventure that was the, um, the launching and the making of Louvre Abu Dhabi. And I was very fortunate to be the curatorial director of the project for uh, six years. Um, really when the project started in, in 2007, um, when it was uh, highly debated in France and especially among French museums. But I discovered, um, you know, that the real power of art, that is to a power of dialogue, you know, something that goes beyond religions, ideology, politics, and that can unite, you know, really people. So. Uh, my, my vision of my, of my job has changed a lot through this experience, and it probably enables me today to be the president of those two wonderful museums and to have a vision which is centered on transmission, on sharing the heritage, the wonderful heritage that we have, and to be open to all publics. And I think that those questions are going to be crucial in the next coming months and coming years after the pandemic is over, hopefully, uh, because we will need to unite again uh, around works of art. We miss art a lot. We miss art because our institutions are closed. And I know that our, um, um, the, the French people and all around the world, people are missing museum as they are missing movies, theaters, um, you know, and everything that expose them to emotions, ideas, stimulating moments, uh, physical experiences also of, of, of art and, and, and culture. So I just um, wanted to tell that uh, I am an eclectic and quite open president of those museums and I'm a strong believer of the connections between arts and disciplines. And uh, this is what I am trying to do uh, in, my, uh, in my strategic choices at the head of those wonderful museums. I will just um, and this very quick uh, self-introduction with a video clip uh, that was filmed a few weeks ago, uh, early December in Orsay, in the central nave of uh, the Musée d'Orsay. You will see um, quite a famous pop French musician called uh, Chassol playing live in the museum and, and, and the video was shot to be on our social networks and our websites. Um, in order, of course, to, to keep the link between the museum and our public and our audience 
and to imagine new connections. And um, what you will see with this clip, video clip is that, that it's inspired by nature because this, um, this spring we will have this wonderful exhibition called The Origins of a World, The Invention of Nature in 19th Century, which deals with the reality of a relationship between modern man and nature, which is a quite a timely subject, I must say. And uh, we invited artists, musicians, uh, to come up with ideas, creations around this exhibition. And Chassol is among those artists. And I just wanted to, to end this presentation with a rather poetic and beautiful vision of what a museum can be also today. Thank you. And, and we'll, we'll keep the conversation later on. We can play the video now if it's possible. That was a wonderful video, and thank you very much, um, Ms. Dakar, for uh, joining us from France. So now let's have uh, Mr. Johnson Chang. Um, so Johnson will be giving us a short introduction, please. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to Night of Ideas. And thank you especially for starting the conversation with such a beautiful duet between 
bird song and piano. Um, it is a proper way to address the situation we have today. And uh, Night of Ideas, uh, of course, we cannot um, draw our minds away from the present predicament of um, the pandemic. So um, um, the, the really the, the first question, of course, will come to everybody's mind, and what is, what significance can we draw from this current pandemic that, that we are in? And uh, the bird song and piano playing just now reminds us we are now uh, in this situation precisely because we actually are uh, facing the revenge of nature. And the, um, the, the pandemic also signals uh, even greater um, historical change, I think, globally, uh, perhaps uh, one of the most dramatic change of an era since um, the late, um, the early 1990s. So um, what, um, we can, what we can draw on this, um, together with another present situation, which is the looming Cold War, which has been dragging on for the last few years. And the Cold War signifies another thing, which is a reaction of old imperial powers resisting the rise of the former Third World. And looking at the two together, um, what we have really is a new era of reckoning. And what are we reckoning with? We are reckoning with the exploitation of nature, and we are really reckoning also with the exploitation of the global political south, um, well, or the former south. So this is uh, the, the broader situation that we are in, but of course, um, the, um, the, the, for the general public today, another thing which is very evident is a lot of the unrest has to do with new technology, uh, it has to do with uh, uh, the new means of mass communication, but they seem more to me to be symptoms rather than the root uh, cause. So in this situation, what is the task for art and art institutions? And uh, if the issue is about the imbalance that is brought about by inordinate exploitation of, of nature and uh, societies, so in the wake of technological evolution, the question will be about finding a new balance. And if we talk about a new balance, of course, this is exactly the task for art. Since um, art, if we understand art to be about the vision and the practice of, uh, of wholeness and of seeking, uh, uh, this seeking of meaning. But art, of course, doesn't operate in a vacuum. It operates, has always operated together with art institutions, whether it is for or against. It works with art histories, it works with collections, it works with uh, its uh, uses being um, applied to in societies. And for institutions to respond to the, the challenge of art, if art actually meets the challenge of our time and comes up with uh, responses and appropriate suggestions of how to deal with, um, about how artists manage to deal with their own sense of brokenness and incompleteness, then uh, the challenge for institutions would be how to respond or transform itself proactively. And um, uh, since we're talking about imbalance, um, of course, within the art world, there is also another um, reflection of the art world, art institutions, and art practices is also a mirror of the wider uh, cultural, political, and economic world. Uh, and there is the hierarchy of, of the art world in global art is one issue art institutions and artists can, uh, can, can deal with and through that transform uh, from a more fundamental and aesthetic way, the way uh, uh, come up with strategies to deal with this, this challenge of the era. And for in art institutions, perhaps the one um, institution has done the most in addressing the issue of imbalance in the last two, three decades has been the rise of biennales and triennales uh, around the world. And this has been the platform for 
art from all sorts of cultures, different levels of uh, uh, political and social economic power to meet each other um, on par. And, and this is one very important institution among the art world, which the you know, museum have been addressing uh, and also working together with. Um, and this is something that has actually been one of the contributions of contemporary art. And I'm sure um, this is also a way forward, um, except that we now have the challenge that a lot of this kind of face-to-face um, -face meeting and uh, uh, the presence of uh, being in the presence of artwork and artists is now no longer feasible within the pandemic. But this is actually temporary. On the long term, it will come back again. But the real issue of the big challenge that has been signified by these problems of the pandemic, of the Cold War, is actually longer term. So um, if we are looking at um, the relation between, um, uh, if you're looking for um, what artists could be doing that actually would be interesting for us to follow, um, it would probably be um, the fact that we are doing, uh, that we are actually at a time when everything is being slowed down to the to degree that artists actually have more time to experiment and more time to uh, reflect. And it is also the time when they are under much less pressure to interact with the, uh, with the world outside. And this means there is more time for them to reinvent the local. And to deal with the local and the indigenous is one of the things that, that can address this imbalance we, we, uh, we're actually facing. And for example, in Hong Kong, um, uh, there, is, there are different ways of reinventing uh, um, lifestyle. Artists actually have come together to um, go into eco-farming as part of the art practice. Um, there are artists who actually attempt experiments in aesthetic democracy. And that is actually um, a very old historical practice of the um, literati scholar gatherings that has been going on since the well, uh, third, fourth century AD. And this is a way for many artists to meet each other and also be challenged aesthetically to confront other people's artwork. Um, and there are also, um, um, during this pandemic time, the experimentation of many artists coming together to form small um, private groups of different practices. They can be uh, groups that deal with new technology, uh, deal with um, uh, experiments in, well, uh, uh, experiments of art which use a media which do not uh, come, you need to have artworks face to face. So this is something that is, uh, uh, um, that will be addressed later on in this, uh, in this forum. And, and if artists are doing these kinds of experiments, um, what we actually are seeing is a possibility for institutions to reconnect them. And what institutions could do is to consider a new network of the locals, of locals and indigenous from around the world. And this is a kind of international um, cooperation that can go beyond um, the traditional type of uh, museum exchange. Well, but of course, uh, we all know um, at the end of the day, all artists must look back to the museum as the place where they actually will find, where, can, can they, where they can find, I wouldn't say find solace, but at least they can find where works get canonized. And also museums is the place where art ultimately will, con will help, uh, make the attempt to, um, to reconstruct or at least to, to bring forward this power of, um, power of awe, the power of the religious sense of magic that has been lost in mundane life. And also the most important thing, uh, the connectedness and the balance, the, uh, and the imbalance that we are addressing uh, uh, has to do with the brokenness in space and time also. And a lot of histories uh, in this last two centuries from many cultures have been broken, uh, broken in order to catch up with modernity. And I think that kind of um, 
that kind of brokenness also now should be addressed as another form of the um, uh, international cooperation, international imagination that, sh that we hope will come from post-pandemic time. So thank you very much and look forward to ideas from other speakers. Great, thank you very much, Johnson. Um, so we have some uh, questions uh, for the discussion time. And if you are watching this live and you have questions for our panelists, please do not hesitate and leave a comment in our live chat box and uh, we'll be very happy to take your questions. So before um, taking your questions, uh, I, uh, we do have some questions for our, for our speakers. Um, so um, Mr. Carr mentioned um, the power of art is the power of dialogue. And um, Johnson mentioned finding a new balance uh, through art. Um, I think perhaps these are the two very important points that we have, uh, that we have learned uh, from, uh, from the unprecedented challenges that we, we experienced in 2020. And to look forward, how do you envision um, the art world will be like in a post-COVID era? So um, maybe, Johnson, would you answer that? Um, during, uh, very few people can travel during this pandemic time. And this is actually a great luxury if you're not, you not caught with the virus. Um, this is actually a time when a lot of people manage to, to rethink their connection to, the, to people who are near them, uh, relatives, uh, friends, of course. But also, to, um, it is a time when people can start to explore and come back into themselves. And there's one very interesting example uh, that, I th uh, that I think um, Chinese uh, art professionals well remember. Uh, one of the most important outbursts of creativity uh, from mainland China happened between the years 1989 and 1992. And within these two, three years, artists who have been uh, doing promising works in, in the 80s started to remake started to um, re, um, revisit their own practice. They started to um, go into areas that would have reflected much greater reflection. They were not afforded to accord it to them uh, in the, in the uh, decade before that. So that actually was one of the uh, very important time of incubation for art of the 90s in China. And it was a transformative time. And today I see this possibility, again, opening up for the creative community. Mm. Great. Thank you, Johnson. Mr. Carr, do you have anything um, that you would like to add? How do you envision an art world in a post-COVID era? I would be cautious about predictions, you know, especially with this uh, pandemic, but, it, but, uh, but you know, is, is quite a long experience that we all sense now. So. Um, I think that what we have experienced over the last year, and maybe it gives us ideas for the, the, the what is coming next, is that uh, we need more than ever each other in terms of uh, collaborations with uh, international or national institutions. And I very much think also that the, the local uh, questions uh, are very, very important, uh, you know, in the museum world. Uh, what, what we see is uh, a desire, it's, it's an expression of solidarity and an expression, uh, you know, of, um, of wanting, still wanting to work together, to, to, to build things together, to have projects together. Of course, we are now in a very uh, difficult moment because we cannot project ourselves with precision, which is, of course, a little bit difficult when you're at the head of an institution because you're supposed to plan everything. And of course, what, what the virus is, is teaching us is that nothing can be planned right now. So you, you have to, 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 to work really on two levels, the uh, immediate questions, and there are tons of questions to, um, to, um, to answer and including the connection with the public, staying in touch with the public. How do, how do you reach out to the audience when you cannot open the door, the physical door of, a, of, a, of an institution? And you have at the same time to work on a long-term uh, reflection. Uh, 
um, with um, what will be the international collaboration in the future. Uh, will we make the same kind of exhibition at the same pace? Um, what can you can we envision other types of collaboration? What is the right place of digital in a uh, for? Uh, museums that are dealing with uh, historical collection, which is the case of Orsay and Orangerie, when you're talking about heritage. How do you connect heritage with living artists? Um, and I um, think it's more than ever extremely important because a museum is, is um, at the center of society, should be connected to society. And for instance, over the last month, we had uh, a very interesting experience with a French artist called Laurent Grasso. We had commissioned to Laurent uh, a film about the origins of the world, the same exhibition that inspired Chassel in the video. And um, uh, when he started working on this project, Laurent imagined that he would, he, he would shoot you know, images all around the world of a nature that is being, you know, in a, in a moment of crisis because of the, um, of, of, of course, of a human action. Um, and of course, the, um, the pandemic started um, uh, a year ago. So uh, Laurent couldn't, couldn't travel and couldn't shoot the video. So he, he had to rethink the whole project during the first lockdown in France in last March and April. So we work together to imagine a new project we win, saying, addressing the same question, but addressing it from the heart of the crisis, from the heart of the pandemic. So um, uh, Laurent uh, worked with images that had been already shot, but were available, coming from all around the world, observations of nature uh, in, in the pole, in the different countries, in the different uh, continents and mixing them with his special intervention and talent for that. But, you know, we had to rethink completely um, this, um, this, this project um, and working from the crisis point of view, I would say, which was extremely interesting because, uh, you know, we could have imagined saying, oh God, we have to cancel everything. We cannot shoot, so let's forget it. The project is, is not workable. And on the contrary, um, what an artist can do in that, at that moment is to say, no, 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 this constraint is interesting and we're going to play with it. We're going to find a dynamic, a creative dynamic within this constraint and we're going to do, um, uh, you know, something interesting um, of, this, of this problem. And it's exactly what he has done and the video uh, it is now made and it's, it's really, it's really um, very, very beautiful and very telling of the creative um, power also that, that comes out of a crisis. The way man, uh, when he's gifted, when he's talented, when he wants to um, do things can, you know, um, find something positive out of a, of, of a, a very serious crisis. So it's why I cherish this very special relationship that a heritage institution, and an institution that is dealing in this collection with um, um, past com art coming from the past, I cherish the relationships we have with living artists. Uh, whatever the background of those living artists, they can be dancers, they can be filmmakers, they can be visual artists, they can be writers, uh, directors, whatever. You know, because I think that they will help us, uh, curators, art historians, to find new ways of looking at our collections, of sharing them, of inventing maybe new formats um, of uh, exhibition or maybe another word for exhibition, I don't know, in coming years. And I think that uh, um, we, we, we should really work with the artistic community um, with, um, around those questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Carr. It's true that um, uh, it, the, the pandemic has given, uh, has given a lot of artists and art professionals to take a, to take a, to still take a break from the usual you know, travel routine and to reflect and then um, and also to be creative, um, to come up with new solutions and new ideas to work around and to continue to make art. Um, so 
if you have questions, please um, send us via um, Facebook. So it seems that we have uh, some questions coming in. Okay, so we have one question from the audience. We have quite, quite a few questions. Um, this one. So, um, any advice for young artists, administrators, creatives who might be struggling because of the pandemic? Advice for young artists, administrators, and creatives. Keep, keep, keep working. Keep, um, keep the faith. Uh, we'll go through this and uh, uh, project yourself. Imagine yourself uh, out of the pandemic. And uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, we will need, I mean, the artistic community uh, is, is not at all um, you know, not working right now. I mean, it's, it's an extremely active because it's it's almost entered a sort of resistance, you know, um, um, spirit. That is to say that uh, to to underline how essential art and creation are in our lives. It, I mean, art is what also makes us a special animal, a human being, you know. Uh, so. Um, so we, we, have to, we have to keep working, we have to keep imagining, even, even if it's very hard for a moment, very um, disconcerting and somehow depressing when you cannot project yourself with precision. But we have to keep, um, to keep working and I'm, I'm sure that the experience we are all going through is going to be um, extremely rich in terms of inspiration and, and, and a bouncing back, you know, when we'll be able to be as free as we wish to be free uh, today. Yes. I, I agree completely. Um, I think um, whatever the practice of these artists is, or any artist, whatever they do is actually equally important because um, some artists may think that they are actually only part of a fragment at this time when they are not communicating with, uh, with their colleagues uh, face to face. Um, although, of course, we are now in a different era than before. But um, they, are, they might feel that they are being cut off. They are not actually doing things in a, in a, in a complete way like the film that has been cut short uh, in the research. But uh, I believe very strongly that any artist who make a work that is complete, whatever the scale, and whatever the ambition, ultimately it is about something complete. And we are, we are in fact looking to art to tell us and to instruct us how to find completeness in any fragment. So um, it is very important for artists to continue to work. Absolutely. We have two minutes and um, so we'll take one more question from the audience. Um, so this one. Um, do artists, art professionals, and art institutions have a responsibility in the society's recovery and evolution? Yeah, we do have, as an institution, I can answer for a national institution, we, of course, we have a responsibility. Uh, maybe not an obvious one or a direct one, but we are part of a, a social life and uh, we, we, we need to be part of the recovery, so opening our doors more open than more widely, you know, as 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 possible and as ever, you know, and 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 will be, I'm sure that will be a very small part of the answer to 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 this uh, recovery questions, but this small part is going to be extremely important symbolically speaking because. Uh, because of a special, again, power or status of art, you know, in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds. Uh, so we'll be there, you know, when it's possible again to meet again, to welcome, to experience um, the, uh, the joy of being together in a special place, to enjoy a work of art. We have to be there and we have to be there at with a, a level of excellence, of, of creation, of uh, imagination you know, more than ever, you know, we, we need to be very, very good. We cannot miss this, this rendezvous that we give to, um, uh, to all, um, all the future visitors of our institutions because they will need us and we will need uh, them, you know, to uh, recover altogether.
obviously. Thank you very much, Mr. Ka. Uh, we're running out of time, uh, but thank you very much, um, Johnson and Mr. Ka, for joining us this evening. So we'll have more programs coming up. Um, stay tuned. Thank you.
First, uh, Director To, thanks a lot for agreeing to do this interview. Are you surprised by the impact your films have had outside of Hong Kong on general audience, but also on other artists all over the world? Actually, 我自己都希望自己的电影都多啲观众或者他的最善的方法in your opinion, what is the cultural place of Hong Kong cinema in the city and in the world? Um, 影響的話 美國也好,南美洲也好,等等國家的電影,香港人都是可以很欣賞他們的 都是很多東西都是借鏡荷里活或歐洲的電影 就拿他最好的东西来复制到似香港 uh, How do you see your cinema evolve after 2020, especially considering the evolution of technology and mediums available? Uh, 大陸的電影的發展很多時候電影會傾斜了或者會主力了在進入中國市場而在中國市場裡面是不是香港導演的發揮的地方而在香港電影的好處就是它是融合很多不同的我剛剛說過不同的文化在裡面他是希望是沒有任何的很大考慮
，我好希望未來二零二零又好，其實二零二二誒誒誒誒十年八年前，我都覺得係係咪大家可以諗闊啲，將自己嘅創作時候擺喺全球嘅地方，而不是擺喺一個、呃呃呃、既定嘅。一個市場上面，我我我認認為我亦都鼓勵希望年輕嘅一代咧，去諗世界人明白嘅電影，摩定一部分人明白嘅電影咯。我喺呢度上面，我覺得如果小朋友演新一代，而家近年嚟出咗好多新嘅唔同嘅導演啊，我覺得佢哋應該考慮多啲呢個角度咯。其實我覺得就係、是呃、作為我哋係一個 filmmaker 或者係一個軟件嘅製造人。我哋應該、呃、可以將自己拉闊啲嘅、呃，我哋要嘅係觀眾睇我哋嘅作品。如果能夠去到大人幕，亦都係非常好嘅事。如果去到係誒、呃、類似而家最流行嘅 TV series 或者係啲 mini series 嘅嘅嘢，亦都冇冇乜所謂喺我自己會覺得。而未來個科技亦都隨住。誒誒誒，佢、呃、嘅、呃、改變令同我哋生活越嚟越誒誒、呃呃、息息相關啦、啊。而我會睇到嘅電影誒、呃，或者係呢個製作軟件製作咧，係只有越嚟越要多同埋越要闊嘅。咁誒、呃、新嘅科技係絕對會帶嚟個誒時代裏邊某一啲嘅刺激，但係佢會不停變啊！我我我可以咁講就係話。嗰、那個渠道大咗，但係未,未知係咪一個好處、啊呃、作為我自己覺得就係呢、這個、呃、平台係闊咗嘅 ，OK 好嘅誒，亦都係因住隨住嗰個 technology 嗰、那個即係所有嘢嘅變化咧，我哋嘅設計上面嘅嘅嘢咧係比以前仲要闊大嘅，即係誒誒唔需要。話去到、呃、好似以前咁樣，就係、是、好多嘢受我哋真係要要 exactly 見到嗰樣嘢就拍嗰樣，而家唔使嘅，而家係好多嘢你係可以係從個 CG 裏面啊，或者係用一啲其他嘅技巧上面咧，可以達至到另一種誒唔、呃、同嘅幻想嘅。咁誒誒，無論如何，我哋電影係有歷史以嚟，電影都係隨住科學嘅發展而發展出唔同嘅。嘅誒形態出嚟嘅，咁呢個係人類追求誒未來嘅主要部分裏邊咧，誒電影都會隨住走。
First, uh, Director To, thanks a lot for agreeing to do this interview. Are you surprised by the impact your films have had outside of Hong Kong on general audience, but also on other artists all over the world? Kate 我自己會覺得個人的風格很重要的都能夠明白我自己講的東西或者是欣賞我的東西的時候呢這個就是即是幾大的一個幫助嚟的In your opinion, what is the cultural place of Hong Kong cinema in the city and in the world? 香港電影當然你和我們全盛時期的香港電影去比的時候都有一個現在是有很大的距離 但如果你要講出香港電影和世界的接軌上面有什麼影響的話我覺得香港電影如果是沒有影響到其他外國的觀眾的時候荷里活也不會找那麼多的香港的導演或者演員去荷里活拍戲我覺得我們香港很獨特
，我好希望未來二零二零又好，其實二零二二誒誒誒誒十年八年前，我都覺得係係咪大家可以諗闊啲，將自己嘅創作時候擺喺全球嘅地方，亦不是擺喺一個誒誒誒既定嘅。一個市場上面，我我我認認為我亦都鼓勵希望年輕嘅一代咧，去諗世界人明白嘅電影，摩定一部分人明白嘅電影咯。我喺呢度上面，我覺得如果小朋友新一代而家近年嚟出咗好多新嘅唔同嘅導演啊，我覺得佢哋應該要考慮多啲呢個角度咯。其實我覺得就係、是呃、作為我哋係一個 film maker 或者係一個軟件嘅製造人。我哋應該可以將自己拉闊啲嘅、呃。我哋要嘅係觀眾睇我哋嘅作品。如果能夠去到大人幕，亦都係好事，非常好嘅事。如果去到係誒、呃、類似而家最流行嘅 TV series 或者係啲 mini series 嘅嘅嘢，亦都冇冇乜所謂。喺我自己會覺得，而未來個科技亦都要隨住。誒誒誒，佢、呃、嘅、呃、改變令同我哋生活越嚟越誒誒、呃呃、息息相關啦。而我會睇到嘅電影誒、呃，或者係呢個製作軟件製作咧，係只有越嚟越要多同埋越要闊嘅。咁、呃、新嘅科技係絕對會帶嚟個誒時代裏面某一啲嘅刺激，但係佢會不停變、啊、我,我,我可以咁講就係話。嗰、那個渠道大咗，但係未,未知係咪一個好處、啊呃、作為我自己覺得就係呢、這個、呃、平台係闊咗嘅 ，OK 好嘅誒，亦、呃、都係因住隨住嗰個 technology 嗰、那個即係所有嘢嘅變化咧，我哋嘅設計上面嘅嘅嘢咧係比以前仲要闊大嘅，即係誒誒唔需要。話去到、呃、好似以前咁樣，就係、是、好多嘢受我哋真係要要 exactly 見到嗰樣嘢就拍嗰樣，而家唔使嘅，而家係好多嘢你係可以係從個 CG 裏面啊，或者係用一啲其他嘅技巧上面咧，可以達至到另一種誒唔、呃、同嘅幻想嘅。咁誒誒，無論如何，我哋電影係有歷史以嚟，電影都係隨住科學嘅發展而發展出唔同嘅。嘅誒形態出嚟嘅，咁呢個係人類追求未來嘅主要部分裏面咧，誒電影都會隨住走。Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Night of Idea 2021. Now we are having our first panel discussion, and I'm delighted to be here with four notable and renowned speakers to talk about the roles and works of the museum. I'm Apple, the moderator of this panel discussion. Museums are at the heart and crossroads of different artistic movements that flows alongside the tide of time. Night of Ideas, indeed, gives us an excellent opportunity at the beginning of 2021 to bring together some outstanding visionary museum presidents, director, and curator here. Let me first introduce our guest speakers. Ms. Kathleen Pega, president of the Palace Museum and National Estate of Versailles. Ms. Suhanya Raffo, director of Amplus Museum. Mr. Lohan Lapon, President of the Museum National Picasso Paris. And last but not least, Dr. Raymond Tang, Curator of Hong Kong Heritage Museum. To start the discussion, I would like to invite all the speakers to introduce themselves mm -hmm. and their institutions. After that, we will discuss some interesting topics and last, there will be a time for Q&A. We start with Ms. Catherine Pekar, please. Hello, thank you, Apo. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. 
And in this impeccable time, it's a pleasure to meet you in Hong Kong today. My English is very bad, as you can hear, but it's a relief to share a conversation with you as we are stuck in loneliness. We are here to think of future, but let me tell you that we also dream of the past world when we fly on Mechie's shoulder everywhere in the world. Anyway, I have been the president of Chateau de Versailles for nine years. Um, it's my honor to be the chairman of this unique place. I was a journalist before and then advisor to President Sarkozy between 2011 and 2000, uh, 2007 and 2011. Difficult to describe my job today in Versailles. Every day is so different because Versailles is different every day, even and perhaps even more with lockdowns and curfews. It's not only a palace, <laughs> but three with Grand and Petit Trianon. It's an opera with 700 seats, dramatic laws today, but the season was planned for 100 spectacles to celebrate its creation 250 years ago. Uh, it's a historical monument, of course, but it's a national museum with uh, 70,000 pieces and masterpieces. It's a royal residence and it's a venue at the service of the French Republic. It's an outdoor museum, the biggest in the world with sculptures, fountains, groves. It's a rendezvous for contemporary art. It will be a campus mm. next year for preservation of aircraft. Um, a thousand people work for this place, but we consider that nearly 2,100 uh, people are involved in the daily life of Versailles. Lastly, Versailles has been built for the world for visitors by King Louis XIV. We had 8 million visitors uh, one year ago, and now no one today, of course. Uh, nearly 2 million, uh, perhaps, last year, 2020. Uh, that's why we can't imagine this place is closed. That's why we must have the most diversified offer. And perhaps we are going to talking about it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pega. So may I invite Ms. Suhanya Rafal, please? Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And compared to the Versailles Palace, I have to say for M+, we are embryonic um, in, in distance. But to be preparing a new museum, a major new museum in Hong Kong, as we get ready to open this museum at the end of this year, it's an extraordinary <laughs> journey that we have seen for our M+. I have been the director for the last four years, and previous to that, Lars Nitvi was the inaugural director for five years before that. So it's already taken um, nine years in the making. And good things take time, because for the first time in Hong Kong, we see a global museum of visual culture that spans architecture, design, visual art, ink, and moving images. And this museum has been designed by the Swiss architects Herzog and de Moron, and it's a very large museum of 17,000 square meters and 65,000 square meters of museum. <coughs> I should say that it's very important that we see in Asia, in Greater China, in Hong Kong, an institution that is of equivalence to, say, the Pompidou in Paris or the Museum of Modern Art in New York that also has that same ambition to think about the modern and contemporary in relation to visual culture. And like those cross-disciplinary um, interests, M plus two brings that to the fore. But our voice, our distinctive voice, is is captured by a collection that is rooted in Hong Kong and then moves out into <coughs> greater China and Asia. And for the first time, and I think Hong Kong is the only city that could have borne 
uh, such an institution of international ambition, global ambition, but a deep local root that understands the transference of ideas, the movement mm -hmm. of peoples and, um, I, and, and, mm -hmm. and thinking. So I thought because we are here a night of ideas and we are celebrating a relationship with France, I would talk about two parts of the collection that we've brought um, recently. We've been spending the last seven years collecting intensively. We have over 8,000 objects and 46,000 archives. And one of, that, one of those groups of collections and archives is our Duchamp collections. And the reason that I'm putting it up is because our founding collection was of contemporary Chinese art, by, gifted by Uli Sig, that dates from the 70s all the way through four decades. And for us to collect Duchamp, who, as we know, is a figure from early Cubism, Surrealism, but really the uh, spiritual mentor the, of, of conceptual art. And conceptual art was such an important tool for the avant-garde moments of Chinese art. And in our museum, we will decenter Duchamp from his normal canonical understanding and recenter him in relation to our contemporary Chinese collections, which are outstanding. There is no collection that tells us that story um, in any part of the world. And of course, each museum must do unique things. And it's time that we had institutions in Asia that, were, that, that take hold of and purchase of our stories. And the second um, group of works that I want to talk about are, um, and introduce in this forum are the uh, collection of design that was gifted by um, the family of Madame Sung, who brought, uh, who was an entrepreneur, an artist, um, interested in fashion, in design, and married um, Marin Verovova from, um, uh, who was studying in Be Beijing, and he was. Um, it was a very important marriage in 1949, and she bought the first Pierre Cardin collections to um, China and established a collection, but also a real intersection into film design and visual culture that looked at the story of Beijing, Hong Kong, Paris. So this is uh, an international story that was really centered around the 70s and 80s. So we have this amazing collection of vintage Pierre Cardin mm -hmm. from that period. And um, it's, a, it's a kind of an example of how the museum is thinking about the relationship that it has with its collections that are from here, but also have a very interesting resonance in terms of the international and the global. So I will stop there. Yep, thank you, Suhanya. Mr. Luhan Napon, please, you could share your PowerPoint. It's already done, I think. Yes, uh, Mr. Luhan Napon. Voilà, that's it. Yep. Yep. Do you see my image? Can I go to the... So, good evening to everybody. Thank you for your invitation. Um, uh, I, my English is very poor, and I know nothing about Picasso. That's why uh, I'm the president of this museum. Uh, but I'm quite a good specialist of a garden globes. I will come back to this idea uh, on the next uh, moment. Uh, two or three ideas about our collection and about Picasso. Of course, everyone knows uh, this uh, artist. Uh, this is a self-portrait from 1901. This is a self-portrait from 1972. Uh, in between these two moments, uh, Picasso created around 60,000 works. During this moment, the French government bought only one painting, this one, in 1933. We have always to think about this uh, before the opening of the National Museum of Modern Art in 1947. There were some donations, but almost nothing. And so when Picasso died, in 1973, thanks to André Malraux and the law of the Dacian, uh, the state were able to create a wonderful collection of 6,000 more. And just to see how a curator can do something with some masterpieces, this is how the studio of Picasso looked like uh, in 1957, 
and this is the work of creator uh, after uh, the Dacian in 1979. So you have before and after. You always have to remember that when you are in charge of, of a museum. Uh, with this wonderful collection, we have to find a place. And we found one, uh, which is called the Bourse du Commerce. It was uh, 40 years ago. But uh, unfortunately, uh, it was a disaster. And uh, finally, uh, you will uh, be able, uh, within a few weeks, to see uh, this wonderful place, but not with Picasso, but with the works from Francois Pinault, because it will be, as you know, the Pinault collection place. So finally, uh, we were uh, lucky enough to find this wonderful hotel particulier in the Noma, north of Maui, uh, from the middle uh, of the 17th century, just uh, at the same time of the beginning of the kingdom of Catherine. And uh, inside, you see there is this wonderful uh, decor, which, of course, is a nice uh, balance with the masterpieces, of, of course, of the classic period of Picasso. Just to finish and to perhaps launch the, the debate, uh, we are a monographic museum, and so what can we do with a monographic museum? You can have this wonderful moment, like the Gustave Moreau Museum in Paris, but more like a mausoleum, or you can have uh, this idea of, for example, Pierre Soulage, a wonderful French painter, who wanted to create his own museum, but wanted to say, I want my works to be exhibited, but I want some, a place where the art is alive, where we have always exhibition. And we are in this uh, spirit at the Musée Picasso. I will say always in movement. For example, with some kind of duo like Picasso Giacometti or Picasso 1932, where we try to explain how Picasso creates every day during one year many works. For example, here for January 1932. And uh, within uh, a few days, uh, with our friends from the Musée Rodin, with Picasso Rodin. And uh, I will be pleased to welcome you, uh, for example, in Nashville next week, where we will be lucky enough to open a, a show in the, the wonderful country of the US, which after Mr. Trump, we can celebrate the art again. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. LeBron. Dr. Raymond Tang, please. Oh. Bonjour, madame. Bonjour, monsieur. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you so much for the invitations. I'm so happy to have this chance to share with you and on behalf of the Hong Kong Heritage Museum. Um, Hong Kong Heritage Museum uh, is a multi, um, multi-discipline museum and presenting a unique uh, mix of history, art, and culture in a great variety of uh, program. And as one of the youngest uh, uh, major public museum in Hong Kong, last year we, um, we, we uh, last year was the uh, 20th, uh, 20th uh, anniversary of our museum. Um, also, we are the youngest uh, 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 museum in Hong Kong, but over the year we have collect more than um, um, 120,000 pieces of item that covering uh, local design, uh, photography, Chinese art, uh, Chinese opera, and popular culture. I'm, uh, I totally agree with um, uh, Dr. Maria Mock just say that uh, generous donation make the museum. Because in our museum, we have set up a 12 exhibition uh, gallery that include the Jin Yong Gallery, the uh, Chinese uh, Opera, uh, Chinese Cantonese Opera Gallery, the TT Choi Gallery of Chinese Art, and oh sorry, and also the um, um, Zhao Shao Ang Chinese Painting Gallery, and those this gallery was the result of the generous donation from the collectors and artists, and also many uh, very famous collectors in Hong Kong. And um, through the uh, exhibitions and the collections and also our research, we like to showcasing 
um, we like to showcase the um, cultural and heritage um, background of Hong Kong, and also we like to um, showcase the uh, collective cultural memories of Hong Kong people. And tonight, I bring with a short video to show you about how energetic uh, um, image of our museum. And please show the video. Hungarian 展示出香港豐富的生活和創意文化讓觀眾全面感受李小龍的武術在上設展廳讓你陶醉在雅致的古典文化之中無論是建築、展品或文物古蹟 You may wonder why I um, bank with a video that uh, present in Cantonese because I would like to show you our language. Cantonese is also one of the very important cultural elements of our city. And I hope you enjoy and I hope to see you uh, someday later in our museum. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the introduction. Many conferences have been discussing museums role in the 21st century or how museums are to bridge different cultures, traditions, artists with our audiences. However, how could we keep up the expectation of our audiences nowadays? It is inevitable for us to continually reinvent ourselves and reflecting present thoughts through different mediums and platforms. Think out of the box. What are the changes for us all after this exceptional year? It's a broad and exciting topic to discuss. So let's begin. Firstly, I would like to ask Ms. Catherine Pega, being the president of a historic site with over 60,000 collections, offering a chronological overview of France history as head of the oldest institution amongst us all here, we have, you have given us stunning contemporary artist programs, tours, and virtual programs last year. Could you share some of them with us? What is your future plan to reinterpret the past and present, as well as the spirit of Brazil? Ms. Pega, please. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, first, today, I think we must insist that you have, we have to face a drama, a drama for culture and a drama, of course, for Versailles. We must fight, fight against emptiness day after day. 
we continue to work, to clean, to restore. But I think we are like a sort of, of uh, docked ship. Uh, we don't know when we'll sail again after the tempest. Anyway, it is the purpose of heritage to survive. And Versailles has survived to wars, chaos, even real tempest, like uh, the one on gardens 20 years ago. Versailles is the key to face the future. That means every day we discover something new, a painting behind the painting you are restoring, even some days ago, a tiny ordinary room which was closed for many years. Versailles is a historical book, of course, but it is a storytelling today. The spirit of Versailles is still living. Um, I have just noticed that uh, last Saturday we had the uh, snow on the gardens at Versailles, and uh, we uh, took we shoot photographs, and um, we had more than one million views on Instagram. That means Versailles is a story in itself, and it continues to be. It was the place of creation, taking the best ideas everywhere, and it remains a bridge between past and present. It makes the future possible. I am convinced of that. Because it is a part of activity in France. You can talk of art de vie, but also education for scholars, art craft, and design and fashion. Today, working uh, with um, our sponsors, the enterprise, or the companies who are working with, uh, with us, they are focusing on green issues. And we have more than 300,000 trees in the gardens, so we can plant trees with uh, our sponsors, like uh, prepare exhibition and so on. When we recover from the COVID, uh, we need to open and open and reopen doors, probably with different offers, with different rules, probably with smallest groups, but we will be ready for that. Uh, we have reopened 70 rooms uh, since 10 years in the Royal Apartments. Uh, we can open our mind with the artists we received and who reinterpret uh, their Versailles, and also, of course, we reopen Versailles every day using new technologies. Yeah, can can you talk a bit more about the virtual Versailles? Ah, the virtual Versailles. Uh, it's a uh, virtual exhibition. We started it like uh, how can I say that uh, on tour, like a concert of Madonna uh, traveling everywhere in the world. And we started it in Singapore um, two years ago. And next week, it will be in Shanghai. And after that, uh, in several cities in China. Why not Hong Kong after that? It's, uh, it's the way to show Versailles when you can't visit it. And uh, with uh, immersive and uh, innovative countries. Like yeah. you can see on the, you can see it now, I think. So how would the audience the think of- for the side before coming in. Um, sorry, how would the audience think of the virtually Versailles? Any interesting feedback you can share with us? Mm. We, we had many, it was very popular when we did it in Shanghai, uh, sorry, in Singapore, and we hope it will be next time the same. But uh, the, uh, of course, the digital production has been steady for years at, in Versailles, and uh, we are publishing videos and exclusive contents each year, I think more than 50 each year. And uh, it, of course, it didn't stop last March when the palace was forced to close the door and quite the opposite, in fact. Um, we have our regular production, but uh, uh, the Palace of Versailles broadcasted some additional contents to all audiences in French, in English, in Chinese also, and in order to keep the link with its visitor and globally with the public. 
Um, we had many, many, many um, attractions, if I may say, um, uh, proposed during the lockdown. Um, the global co community on the uh, social network uh, reaches more than 2 million, uh, 2 million followers and our website more than 10 million in 2020. And also we have many uh, mobile applications that you can uh, help, uh, which can help to visit Versailles with uh, virtuality um, contents, virtual contents also. And um, I think it's the way to continue to welcome visitors and it's the way to prepare the visit and it's the way to design the site. So could you tell us uh, a bit more about the contemporary artist program in your... Uh, the con uh, yeah. Laurent Lebon uh, uh, would, would be better than me to, de to, to discuss that part because uh, he was at the beginning of this rendezvous at Versailles and uh, it's, uh, of course, a very big success. It's a way to convince new generations to come or to convince people who are not uh, involved in heritage and so on to come to Versailles and to discover Versailles with the, through the eyes of uh, our artists. And um, the, 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 the purpose is always the same. The artist gives his uh, relationship with Versailles through his masterpieces presented at Versailles. And we had, uh, of course, exhibition. You can see some photographs. Sorry, this is Olafo Eliasson, but uh, this is Otoniel. Uh, I think you saw before, um, perhaps you saw before Jeff Koontz at the beginning, the first one. And now it was in 19... Uh, no, it's 2019, and it is uh, Anita Molinero, because we we welcome new uh, young artists in the gardens uh, two years ago. Thank you so it's much. A, it's yeah. a way to show differently Versailles. It's a way to explain that Versailles, Versailles is not a dead museum, but still living and making a bridge between past and present. And I think uh, it's very, we are very sorry not to have this uh, contemporary art exhibition this year because it's too difficult to manage and to, to prepare in this uh, in particular time. But uh, I do hope we do it next, time, next year, 2022. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And um, uh, let's shift our eyes back to Hong Kong. We have Ms. Suhanya Rifles here, the director of M Plus Museum. Uh, Suhanya, you helped drive the growth of Queensland Art Gallery from a regional museum to a global museum. And as one of the masterminds of Asia Pacific Triennial of Contemporary Art, and you are now leading one of the most exciting arts and cultural development projects in Hong Kong. It is going to reopen this year. What role do you expect M Plus to play, such as bridging local and international artists with our audience and societies? What is the most challenging issues you are facing? I think um, when I reflect on what has been said by others this evening, the thing to say for M Plus is because we are, our museum hasn't opened yet, it will open at the end of this year, we have been already participating as a museum in the community with pop-up exhibitions when we could, but importantly, our digital presence began early because it felt absolutely normal that we should be thinking about the online presence in any case. So for us, the response in relation to digital work, whether it's with symposia, we also uh, commission artists to work digitally or online um, or um, the work that we were doing with Hong Kong youth um, schools and we moved it directly online as soon as the um, COVID hit. It was, um, it, that was an advantage that we carried by not having a big physical museum because we were able to practice that kind of um, 
digital engagement with audiences both here and elsewhere. I would say though that um, you know, a museum needs to be a physical space, whatever it is. We will always do all kinds of other um, programs and we will encourage and intersect with digital artists because I think for sure as we move now into this kind of phase, there will be a, we, we know the creativity that is being developed and expressed by artists in that, in that realm just ex has exploded and continues. So we need to find ways to reflect on that. And our first digital commission, in fact, was a Beijing, New York artist called Miao Ying, who did a very fascinating, humorous, and uh, critical uh, response to the idea of um, the Great Firewall. And she, we commissioned a work called Hardcore Detox. Um, um, and it, it, it was really, uh, the whole work was thinking about, okay, let's unplug from the big World Wide Web and use the firewall as a way of a detox from that digital world and welcome you to a virtual space that is um, responsive, responding and thinking about what does it mean when you don't plug in to that world. And I think right now in our world today, when we see on one hand a kind of tribalism that has come out of um, uh, the use of social media in a certain form, and at the same time, the connectivity that all of us in, within the museum network, for example, has experienced through the digital space, this kind of schizophrenic dichotomy is something to think about. I mean, I don't know what it will lead to, but it is certainly a fact that and in this time of no travel, the connections as, uh, as a museum world that we have made, and we are seeing it tonight, um, are, are, prof are, are profound too. But I still believe that museum is a civic space, a space of respite, of um, challenge, of imagination, of creativity, of um, understanding who we are now. It's a spirit house and people need it. It is a space that is um, beyond the, the purely physical. It is metaphysical, it's spiritual, and, and we are social creatures. And I think the museums, all of us, in our various um, uh, uh, roles in and bringing to publics different kinds of institutions, they will live and they will live again. And the notion of a recovery, whatever that is, our museums will play a part in that. And I know for us at M Plus, the recovery is, we're hoping at the end of this year when borders begin to open and we can welcome people into the museum. A museum will also play, I think, more and more the role of well-being because um, we have seen the world become sick as human beings and um, we need to recover from that. And we will because as a species we are very strong, we are extremely um, creative and M plus as a museum of modern and contemporary of mid 20th century into the future has to be a place that um, responds and is responsive and considers our role with audiences at home here in Hong Kong. And so for me, the biggest challenge is, is it going to be okay when we open at the end of this year? And if it's not, how is that going to be expressed? But I think what we have learned as a, a group of professionals, but also looking at how artists and creative people have responded to this time, is that we are also flexible, responsive, and you just go with that flow. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, so could Shohan, you, you to share with us what kind of tour exhibition or exchange program you are looking for M plus? Yeah, I mean right now part we've we've already established an M plus international program and when it was physical we were in Tokyo before the the virus, but since then we have we've started to express that as a virtual program with um, the most recent one was with Shanghai with the power station of art to introduce 
a collection of experimental architecture of Archigram, an English or British studio, who never actually made any architecture themselves, but were highly influential as architectural um, uh, teachers. And they placed their archive at M plus because they felt that if there was a city that encapsulated Archigram ideas, it was Hong Kong. Hong Kong, this great vertical city with elevated walkways. Um, and they were, of, of course, they taught many Hong Kong architects. So when we acquired that work, we felt it was really important to start to share it in the region and we established a, a, a relationship with Hong Kong University and uh, Power Station of Art and introduced that work in Shanghai only last month. And we had over 12,000, it was an academic conference, so to have an academic conference with 12,000 people uh, participating was astonishing, it was fantastic. So symposia in, in that sense, but also uh, we continue with our digital programs for in, in Hong Kong and, and beyond. I would say that when we open the museum, the museum will be dedicated to showing our collections, work that we have been doing for the past eight years. Uh, we need to show our audiences here locally first what those collections look like, and they are unique. They are, they are collections that you, can find, that you won't find anywhere else. And um, so the first, first eight months of the museum will be primarily looking at the collections, but the collections are rich and varied and hugely exciting. So have you encountered any difficulties when you plan the online program or, as you said, the collect the data bank and everything? No, um, no difficulties in terms of online, but I would say that when we had um, our last exhibition at our M Plus Pavilion, which is a, a laboratory space that we had on site in West Kowloon, we, we were showing the artist Shirley Tse, who is a Hong Kong, LA-based artist, um, and we had taken her to Venice as part of the Venice Biennale. We work, we collaborate with the Hong Kong Arts Development Council on the presentation of Hong Kong artists at the Biennale. Uh, Shirley, of course, couldn't come. And the curator, Christina Lee, was, is also Hong Kong based in Amsterdam. So to install that work, we had to do a three-way online conference call regularly over days to install the exhibition that had been in, in Venice in Hong Kong. But what was wonderful about that particular, uh, one, she made two works, but one particular work that was commissioned for Venice and then uh, shown here in Hong Kong was called Negotiated Differences and was a, a, a group of rhizomatic sculptures that were turned in wood, connected using traditional Chinese furniture making where you don't use pins or, or glue, but it's gravity and balance that keeps the entire sculpture together. And if one part comes down, the whole thing collapses. And it was a you know, it, it, it was made actually at the time of Hong Kong protest um, in 2019 for Venice, but it, it, I just feel that it is emblematic of our times today where we are connected, but we are all different. And the need to be connected, be different, but still manage to negotiate those differences, a central part of what it means to be alive in the world today, whether it's dealing with social unrest, um, pandemic, or change in its, in its vital sense. But the work that Shirley made was intensely hopeful, optimistic, and open-ended. And that, for me, is a, a, a critical part of thinking about how we bring works like that to publics. Yeah, and uh, thank you, Suhanya. And, um Actually, now Hong Kong is longing for positive energy and um, some good news. So uh, I wish you all the best, and Amplus will be, you know, successfully and you know, open smoothly. Yeah, Thank by you. end of the because year. Because I feel that we will. <laughs> so um, I'm sure we will hear more exciting collaboration from our next speaker. 
And I would like to invite our next speaker, Ms. Lohan Labon, to talk about his vision. Mr. Labon is the man who made so many fantastic fan transformation stories. You worked at Center Pompidou and took up the responsibility on the large scale project Center Pompidou Mets as the first director. And last but not least, the Museum Picasso Paris. The museum holds an extensive collection of Picasso in the world. You said once, Picasso is a symbol of the creative process. After the reopening of the museum in 2014, you have transformed the museum. You talk about having the collection constantly revolving so that people can see different works and thus view Picasso from different angles and from fresh perspective. How would you sustain the dialogue of Picasso with our modern time? And what are the renewed vision of Picasso's work you will offer in 2021 if um, there is no actual visit to the museum? Uh, Ms. Mr. Labon, please. Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, so I bring some images uh, to try to answer to your two questions within one hour or two hours. I don't remember how much we are. Uh, but uh, let's make it short and first of all uh, to be in a lack of dialogue and to be uh, very rude, sorry about that, but uh, I, I would like to say to, to Mrs. Raphael and, uh, and to Mr. Tang that our last show uh, of Picasso was in Hong Kong uh, 10 years ago and we are very open to a new partnership. Uh, so let's do it uh, after this night of ideas uh, if you want. But uh, before that, uh, uh, as you say, uh, as you remember, I say that I was quite uh, a, a light fond of garden gnomes. And in the world of garden gnomes, there is always a problem. It's the birth of garden gnomes, because there are many male garden gnomes, but not so many female. So there is a problem of the birth. And as you can see in this image, uh, all the garden gnomes look like uh, each other. And if I summarize uh, the world of museum, in uh, two or three images, I think I can pass the image, but 1977 with the Saint Pompidou in Paris, uh, 1997 with the Guggenheim in Bilbao, and 2017 with the Louvre Abu Dhabi. You have a very small story of these three wonderful buildings, but I think now, uh, and not uh, because of the, of the virus, I think it's much more deeper. Uh, we have a, another story because if you fly 45 minutes from uh, uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, when the frontier will be open again, because you know there is a, a diplomatic fight, you can go to Doha and you have this. So uh, it's a very strange idea. And if you fly to Mexico, you know, as everyone knows, a very small city, you have uh, the Subaya Museum from Carlos Slim, and 200 meters uh, away, you have the Rumex Museum. So I think today, uh, I will not speak so much about Picasso, but I, I will want to share with my colleagues, my friends, uh, what, what do we want for museums? And I think uh, I always come back to this wonderful image of, of uh, Teshima, you know, near Naoshima, uh, where I think you have a storytelling, wonderful concept, and you have this moment quite unique uh, with contemporary art, with nature, and I think people now are not looking only for this, but they are looking for something unique, something very specific that you can find at the Hong Kong Heritage Museum, at the M Plus, and of course at Versailles. And uh, I like very much this museum, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which was created by a private collector near Dusseldorf in Zollenbruch, Germany, uh, which was a former NATO uh, 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 basis, uh, base. Uh, with rockets, and now, which is a garden, and in the middle, you have uh, some buildings, 12, and you can go from a building to another we are without any guards. The doors are open. You have no labels. You have no artificial light. And with the ticket, at the end, you enter a last building, and you are offered a meal, which is cooked with everything you can see around you. And I think in this place, which is very unique, uh, you have something uh, we all dream about. I think something uh, which makes 
uh, the experience difference because, of course, we like to make cues. Uh, we like uh, to have a, a, a wonderful moment in front of the, the Mona Lisa. But I think today, the, perhaps one of the uh, questions for our museum is how uh, to go in front of the masterpieces. And uh, I just want to, to end my small presentation, and sorry, uh, to come back to Picasso. You can see here Lobad uh, from 1942, uh, in between a, a, a painting of, Mac, of Kandinsky and a painting of, and a sculpture of Max Ernst. Uh, and uh, I show, uh, exhibited this painting in Metz uh, 10 years ago, but behind a wall because I, don't, I wanted the public to stay behind, not to go rush uh, to see where is the label, uh, where is, and you have to find your way, and you go around the world to come to the masterpiece. And I think in this metaphor, I think we have many of the questions we can share tonight, because of course, museums are not going to die, but we are in danger. We are in danger. As you know, in France, uh, we do some surveys very, regularly, and, and the last survey on how people go to the museum were very, uh, 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 very sad moment for us, because uh, for the last 50 years, uh, we have the, the feeling that we didn't make any progress uh, to make our young audience coming to the museum. And I think this will be not only a debate between virtuality and reality, because I think we, have, we are fed up with the opposition of these two worlds, I think, of course, uh, one of the answers will be in the harmony in these two moments. Uh, sorry to have belonged uh, to your questions and perhaps not to focus on Picasso. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Levant. We can't wait to go to Paris and see all the coming, upcoming exhibition. And um, lastly, we have my old teammate, uh, Dr. Raymond Tang, um, and uh, you have been curating numerous exhibition and education programs covering Chinese antiquity, Chinese painting, modern and Hong Kong art. Maybe you can share with us your vision on how to revitalize uh, heritage. Yes, um, maybe for some people, the, they think about that heritage or history may be so boring, and if you put this uh, element or put these items into the museum, it will be something that will be, uh, this, will be displayed in a certain kind of the static uh, uh, format. But we try to provide a new impression for the people when we show something about our heritage. And could it be possible we can connect with the younger generations? We can connect with the contemporary artists uh, recently, we have uh, an exhibition uh, about Hong Kong printing. That may be very boring, but we try to put some more other element in this exhibitions. And at the very beginning, uh, when we kickstart to plan about this exhibition, we have a very interesting story behind the scene. Uh, our collaborator, the director of the Hong Kong Open Pin Shop, Ms. Yong Song Mui, one day she received an email from Holland from Dr. Uh, Ronald Sturt. He was trying to look for a set of um, um, movable Chinese uh, letterpress uh, typeset that, that were exported to Holland in the mid 19th century. At the same, in the same time, at the same time, um, Yong also doing the research on this um, um, movable Chinese typeset. So they joined together and to kickstart an international gen, uh, generally in searching for the real object of this typeset. Finally, they found the matrix in one of the museums in Holland. And then they asked for the support of this museum and then to land out their, their uh, matrix. And they tried to do the research and then to recast that 
very wonderful Hong Kong type. We call that Hong Kong type. And this, because of this uh, interesting story and the uh, uh, in-depth research behind the scene, so finally we come out with this uh, interesting story that we bring back all this uh, 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 some of the sample of the matrix and then together with some uh, new recasted uh, Hong Kong type set and then to put in this exhibition and also we take this opportunity to introduce about the development of the Hong Kong uh, painting uh, history we know that uh, in uh, one 1920s, the uh, letter, uh, letter press industry began to be uh, 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 very um, important in Hong Kong, and then many family run the firms were set up in Central, and by the 1970s um, up until the 1980s, the Letter press industry in Hong Kong was in a full glory. However, in the 1990s, that the whole industry uh, were gradually uh, declined due, due to the widely use of the uh, computer typeset in printing. But luckily, a new generation had tried to make use of this traditional painting technique and to use their te uh, traditional technique to uh, incorporate with the contemporary design and then bring the new life of the development of this uh, typeset in Hong Kong. And some um, young artists, they try to, uh, they inspire by how to revitalize such a kind of the uh, traditional technique and also uh, making use of the different um, um, elements to um, enrich the cre uh, new creations of this uh, old um, uh, showrooms of the um, um, technique. And for example, like uh, 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 sisters uh, uh, Donna Chan and uh, Nicole Chan, they established their D2D2 uh, studio and then they handling um, some new design and making use of the printing and doing some collaboration with the other contemporary artists and then to do a series of new uh, design product to introduce how to revitalize uh, this old traditions um, 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 technologies. And also the open pin shop also um, put their efforts in Pomo, this uh, traditional um, um, painting technique. And some young artists also making use of the traditional printing technique and also the, uh, uh, this letterpress um, and also use the movable Chinese um, typeset to interact with their own artistic creation. For example, like Chen Lai Gun, she is a poet and artist. She had followed the master uh, printer to learn about the technique of composing letters and letter setting. And then she made use of this technique to, his, uh, to her own work. For example, like this series of uh, print art that now on display in our exhibitions. So you can find that she composed the poem using a few of movable typeset that she picked up from the uh, letter set shelf and then print them on an image with the seal screen print cloud and with the color on the paper and then to try to create the feeling of the, the, the typeset and the Chinese character are flying in the air or floating on the water. This series of work transformed the text to image and also showcased the uh, different aspect in the use of the movable typeset in printing and also in artistic creations. So we would like to make use of this sample to 
um, tell people that heritage is not just something put into the museum in the showcase, but they can have the new new life when you using an other or some more creative and innovative way to using them. So we like to make our exhibition more energetic and more um, um, uh, creative and then make use of this way to introduce something that we are proud of about our heritage. Thank you Thank so you. much, Raymond. And um, I browse through the iPads, and uh, we have some questions from our audience. And I try to read some uh, to our speaker. And I find two very interesting information is uh, asking about uh, Mr. LeBon and Ms. Pega. Um, Hong Kong audience are asking, will um, your exhibition come to Hong Kong and when? Uh, is there any possibility that um, we will have the honor to have your exhibition uh, to come to Hong Kong? Uh, maybe Ms. Pekka to um, tell us a bit more about that. Yes, of course. I, I went to Hong Kong um, two years ago, and uh, we were talking about an exhibition in Hong Kong about uh, the, the virtual exhibition in the virtual universe. This one is ready. Whenever you want, we can give it to you. And uh, I think it will be a very good uh, symbol for us to show that uh, we are traveling abroad, even if we can't uh, take our collections uh, today uh, in other museums because uh, of the problems of the COVID. But uh, anyway, after this, uh, this uh, sad period, of course, we have many proposals to, to, to share with Hong Kong. And um, it would be my pleasure to discuss of it, of course, and to show um, uh, the, the, the masterpieces of the sign in many different parts and we can have uh, many different projects in there. And the pleasure of going back to, to, to Hong Kong, of course. Yep. Thank you so much, Ms. Pekka. How about Ms., uh, Ms. Talabon? Will we have the honor to have Picasso's exhibition in Hong Kong again? Whenever you want, whenever you want. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, we are I'm ready. ready. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready, we can, we can start. We can even, we can even make, make uh, a wonderful dialogue with the works of Versailles. Picasso of course, yeah. goes. Picasso goes with everything, you know. And we, and when we, too. when we show the the Rideau Parade in Hong Kong, I, I remember it was quite mm -hmm. a success. And when we did the, the show with Hong Kong Heritage Museum, I, I think it was also a great success. I was not a director at that time, but uh, and of course uh, it was ten years ago, if I if I remember well. I think. The interesting thing with Picasso is it's always in movement, as I say. And uh, of course, now we can do something new. And of course, something in partnership uh, is uh, something to invent with you. Uh, and I think you are uh, the one who, who are so fond of this wonderful genius. And uh, I know that some collectors of your wonderful uh, state uh, uh, both some works of the master, so why not uh, doing something? Yep. Voilà. Thank, thank you. Uh, on behalf of Hong Kong audience and our museum colleagues here, we thank you so much, and uh, we are going to have the chance to see all the amazing exhibition. And actually, I have another question from the audience um, addressing to uh, Raymond and Suhanya, and uh, the question is: uh, Do artists? Art professional and art institution have a responsibility in society's recovery and evolution. Maybe Suhanya. Can yes, I will start. I think, of course, without question, the institution has responsibility. Like I said, I, I think of museum as a really important part of understanding history, local histories, immediate local histories, regional histories, but also. Um, the creative imagination that is at play that is part of human beings. 
and how that's expressed in um, each of our cultural institutions and at, say, in Hong Kong, we have to be alert and um, provide the kind of insight because I think museums are also trusted. We are, we are institutions that have developed a, a relationship with audiences that I think in the end is about trust, the information, the research, the thinking, the independence of um, voice. That is where you find um, interesting, elliptical, challenging, uh, but at the same time vital um, examples of um, the creative process, the great imagination. And so I think the recovery, we, we are like an essence of that. Raymond? Yes, um, I agree with uh, Shohanya. And as uh, social uh, institutions and cultural institution museum um, should have made use of uh, uh, its resources to, uh, traditionally they will put the resources in doing research and um, uh, holding exhibitions. And, but I think in the future, maybe we should have some more effort put into the education side because for example like during the uh, pandemic um, people cannot be visited they cannot be able to visit museum anymore but uh, in this uh, several months we um, put our effort to um, introduce some online program and trying to making use of this opportunity to do something that we have uh, which or haven't explored before. And for example, like the online program, maybe we just think about the online talk or uh, online tour guides, something like that. But we're trying to do something different, even though for the online, uh, uh, online uh, guided tour, we added some more um, different uh, approach in this. And also we make use of this opportunity to uh, engage with some other NGOs and some uh, creative team that they have some new idea. For example, like recently we collaborate with Walk in Hong Kong. They are a group of young uh, um, artists, young producer that they um, introduce some guided tour. Actually, um, they produce some guided tour for the people to join them to tour uh, in in the city around the city at the normal situation, but now they cannot do that. But immediately we uh, collaborate with them to make use of the exhibition gallery and then, and then we produce the uh, program, not just provide the guided tour, but with some interactive um, 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 program, some games, some uh, Q&A sections with them and the people can enjoy the exhibitions more than just the exhibition at home during that time. Um, I think that's a, the, just a very small step. Maybe in the future we will have more and more new um, uh, initiative and new idea that can be come from the museum and also through the project that the museum collaborate with different sector in the society, artists, art, a uh, uh, creative group, not just uh, not just bound to the visual artist, but maybe the architect, the designer, and and even though other NGO and other social sectors, that we have to do that. We should do do it, uh, do that, and then to explore more possibility and opportunity for not just for the museum, but also for the other peoples. So, um, Suhanya, how do you see the effectiveness of uh, virtual exhibition or, as Raymond said, the online program, online tour? It's, a, it's sometimes it's a conundrum. So, for example, when we, pre-COVID, we have been doing a lot of work to develop an informed audience base in Hong Kong for the work that we do. And part of that is uh, we've developed a project called The Rover, which is a creative studio that moves from to schools. It's a, it's a truck that moves. And we work with an artist, creative uh, maker, to go to every single primary and secondary school in Hong Kong and spend time with students. 
And it's a very intense uh, relationship between that creative maker and usually about 18 to 20 students in any one city in, 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 in an evening or an afternoon. But when we went online, it suddenly became thousands of students were zooming in, which was fantastic. But what was, what was lost was the intimacy of an encounter with a group of 20 young people and an artist. And in, in the Hong Kong situation where um, the curricula for um, high school and primary school does not include uh, the arts, it was very important for us to feel that we are um, offering options, vocational options even for young people in terms of a future. But the fact that when we went online that we had so many, you know, really thousands of students coming on, I think for, for me was like, oh, there is a hunger, there is a need. So maybe that need can be satisfied in the beginning through an online presence. But I think the relationship between artists and young people is so wonderful. It, it takes a lot for the, the maker to be involved in that, but it, it is something that, you know, it, it is a, it's a balance that we have to consider because um, the individual contact brings a kind of richness to learning that um, not necessarily felt online. But I would say uh, one of the observations that I, have, I, I feel um, so optimistic about in Hong Kong is the, is the young audiences that are coming to things that we do. The average demographic is from the ages of about 18 to 35. That's the bulk of our audience. And for me, that is very affirming, that that is already an established audience base for M+, which I know is often in the museum world, my previous museum jobs, is the age that we are all trying so hard to capture, but that there is this, this commitment, interest, curiosity to engage is fantastic. Yep. Thank you so much. Um, before we end the discussion, because we don't have a lot of time now, and could you please think of a word or a phrase with a brief explanation to advise our museum colleagues? How could we keep up with this ever-changing society? It can be a broad concept or on a specific area. Uh, may Ms. Pega go first? Um, it's difficult to say. I think the, the, the energy, the, the ideas, they are given by the place, by the collections. And you can use very different ways or medias, but always you must come back to the beginning, come back to the essential, what you have to show, what you have to learn, what you have to tell, what you have to share. Yep, thank you. Um, Suhanya, please. I would say imagination. I think that's the one word that I would say we, we really need to bring to whatever we do. It's got to be imaginative and creative because that is um, what our collections are evidence of. Yep. Uh, Mr. Lapon, please. Thank you. Uh, you remember that we always want to put artists in category in periods. For example, with Picasso, you have the blue period and then, let's say, the pink period. Uh, and uh, uh, today, for, for you, I, I wear it in blue. But it's always more complicated. So behind the blue, which is melancholy, there is always the red. Voilà. So it's much more complicated. So I will say no limits. Let's dream. <laughs> Thank you. Raymond? Thank you. Um, I'd like to recommend to um, everybody, keep your mind changing, but keep your heart and passions remain unchanged. It's very uh, important. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. As a museum colleague myself, I have learned a lot tonight. So many inspiration. It is definitely an eye-opening night uh, indeed. And thank you all. Looking forward to future partnerships and collaboration between France and Hong Kong and let, people, let hope 
art will bring people and our society together. We will now have a break until 9.15 for the second panel discussion at which we will invite artists from Hong Kong and France to share their views on the digital art. Thank you and stay tuned. Taiwan is extremely important for many aspects. Uh, it's very interesting in itself that it's an island. It's submitted, as you all know, by, uh, under a lot of uh, transformation, which is due to urbanization, uh, technical development. It's also uh, the land of typhoons, of uh, earthquakes. It's also, people don't always know that, the most eroded uh, land on Earth, that is where the powers of the uh, erosion is, is, the, is the stronger. Uh, and it's a scale model for the planet Earth for me. So what happens on the planet Earth, if you take Taiwan, it's a scale model. And then we take the exhibition at, in Taiwan, in Taipei, as a scale model of a Taiwan scale model, which is the scale model of the Earth. You and I don't live on the same planet is actually uh, now completely true. Before, you and I don't live on the same planet, just meant uh, you disagree, we don't have the same religion, you don't have the same politics, I'm from the left, you are from the right. But now, you and I don't have the same planet, it means it's a different planet. You live somewhere, and uh, on your planet, there is no climate change, there is no uh, threatening of uh, biodiversity and so on and so forth. And on my planet, the biodiversity is crashing and there is a climate change which is enormously uh, important. So I push the notion of, of planet and different planet to mean exactly that. So is it possible in the scale model of a show to visualize the fact that you and I the different visitors don't live on the same planet, and that they might have to choose which planet they associate well with. We start this biennial with the work of Fernando Palma, and all of those you know, cardboard figures are actually drawn from the Nawa iconography, which is a, a, a group part of Mexico. And therefore, for us, it was very interesting to start the biennial with a kind of like strange encounter with those figures which are, don't have uh, such a clear status. Once you arrive in, within Planet Globalization, we have invited artists who were all depicting one different aspect of the kind of attraction that this planet could have. And a very strong example for this is the work by Franck Lebovici and Julien Seroussi. Two of them focused on an attack which happened in uh, the Republic du Congo, Democratic du Congo, uh, in a small village called Bogoro. And they worked with court practitioners, actual court practitioners, on experimenting different kinds of methodologies in order to work with the evidences. What Julien uh, Seroussi, who was himself a legal analyst in this court, and Franck Lebovici, who is an artist and a poet, did, is that they said, look, let's try to experiment other ways of displaying those evidences. Let's try to put them as a sort of mood board, for example, like an artist or a designer would organize, would organize a studio, like, and let's see if there's not some kind of like new connections which occur. And in the biennial, we will restage that kind of methodological room, this room which is made to ex experiment different kinds of like display of evidences. And the visitors, thanks to the help of a mediator, can put themselves in the shoes of one of these legal practitioners. 
We commissioned an artist called Qin Zhengde. They worked on the iconography of defense, the kind of visual culture of defending oneself within the context of the Cold War in Taiwan. And so they explore that through various materials that you can see uh, within the museum. The artist Femke Hergraven is very interested by the imaginary of the panic room. And in it, she stages a sort of discussion between three extinct species, which, which are avatars of, uh, of a weird sort, which are discussing about the absence of the owner of the space, the absence of the last man. And, and they pretty much, they feel pretty lonely. They're on a lonely planet. We're really happy that we were able to, to launch an important commission to the artist Arui Kaumakan, who creates like some sort of sculptures with wools and other materials using lemikalik, which is a, a Paiwan technique, which consists in weaving into concentric circle. There was a very violent typhoon in Taiwan, which displaced her and all of the members of her village and therefore, how do you relocate once you've been moved out by kind of such a, a strong climatic disruption? Well, that's the question which is at the core of her work, where she tries to recreate through the weaving a form of connection between herself and all of the people from her village that she invites to work.展览的实体本身它其实是对星球不同的描绘跟影响那其实公共计划本身我自己的设定是有点像是不同的星球的碰撞的瞬间那我们该如何去回应或是去闪躲尤其是在现在的全球秩序其实已经变成一种虚构的
Taiwan is extremely important for many aspects. Uh, it's very interesting in itself that it's an island. It's submitted, as you all know, by, uh, under a lot of uh, transformation, which is due to urbanization, uh, technical development. It's also uh, the land of typhoons, of uh, earthquakes. It's also, people don't always know that, the most eroded uh, land on Earth, that is where the powers of the uh, erosion is, is, the, is the stronger. Uh, and it's a scale model for the planet Earth for me. So what happens on the planet Earth, if you take Taiwan, it's a scale model. And then we take the exhibition at, in Taiwan, in Taipei, as a scale model of a Taiwan scale model, which is the scale model of the Earth. You and I don't live on the same planet is actually uh, now completely true. Before, you and I don't live on the same planet, just meant uh, you disagree, we don't have the same religion, you don't have the same politics, I'm from the left, you are from the right. But now, you and I don't have the same planet, it means it's a different planet. You live somewhere, and uh, on your planet, there is no climate change, there is no uh, threatening of uh, biodiversity and so on and so forth. And on my planet, the biodiversity is crashing and there is a climate change which is enormously uh, important. So I push the notion of, of planet and different planet to mean exactly that. So is it possible in the scale model of a show to visualize the fact that you and I the different visitors don't live on the same planet, and that they might have to choose which planet they associate well with. We start this biennial with the work of Fernando Palma, and all of those you know, cardboard figures are actually drawn from the Nawa iconography, which is a, a, a group part of Mexico. Therefore, for us, it was very interesting to start the biennial with a kind of like 
strange encounter with those figures which are, don't have uh, such a clear status. Once you arrive in, within Planet Globalization, we have invited artists who were all depicting one different aspect of the kind of attraction that this planet could have. And a very strong example for this is the work by Franck Lebovici and Julien Seroussi. Two of them focused on an attack which happened in uh, the Republic du Congo, Democratic du Congo, uh, in a small village called Bogoro. And they worked with court practitioners, actual court practitioners, on experimenting different kind of methodologies in order to work with the evidences. What Julien Seroussi, who was himself a legal analyst in this court, and Franck Lebovici, who is an artist and a poet, did, is that they said, look, let's try to experiment other ways of displaying those evidences. Let's try to put them as a sort of mood board, for example, like an artist or a designer would organize, would organize a studio, like. And let's see if there's not some kind of like new connections which occur. And in the biennial, we will restage that kind of methodological room, this room which is made to ex experiment different kinds of like display of evidences. And the visitors, thanks to the help of a mediator, can put themselves in the shoes of one of these legal practitioners. We commissioned an artist called Qin Zhengde. They worked on the iconography of defense, the kind of visual culture of defending oneself within the context of the Cold War in Taiwan. And so they explore that through various materials that you can see uh, within the museum. The artist Femke Hergraven is very interested by the imaginary of that panic room. And in it, she stages a sort of discussion between three extinct species, which which are avatars of, uh, of the weird sort, which are... Hello everyone, uh, welcome back to the Night of Ideas, to start again. Um, this is a second panel discussion. Um, the topic of the discussion is art post 2020, the digitalization of art. Uh, we're very glad to have a um, great panel this evening and I'm sure this is going to be very exciting and inspiring. So joining us this evening, we have Dr. Hong Kang, an artist and a museum expert advisor. Um, we have uh, Chris Chang Hon Him, artist and artistic director of Exceed. And joining us from France, uh, Blanca Lee, artist and director of Tetros de Canal, and also Tatiana Villera dos Santos game designer and interactive artist. So before we go into the group discussion, I would like to invite each panelist to make a short introduction, uh, introduce themselves and talk about their work. And so, so, um, for, so to, begin, to begin this, we, um, the beginning with, we have um, uh, Blanca Lee to start the introduction. Blanca, please. Hello, my name is Blanca Lee and I am a choreographer and a director. And since one year, I am also directing one of the biggest theatres in Spain. It's called Teatro del Canal, where we have three different stages. And um, I would like maybe to show you my video. Bienvenue.
hey, hey, and you don't have to hide away, yeah. Well, thank oh, you very much. It's Wanda. much more. <laughs> great video. Hello? Uh, great videos. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, uh, I am uh, working in, in um, different aspects in my career as a choreographer. I directed uh, three uh, feature films, uh, I did many music videos, uh, many art videos, and also uh, I work a lot in, um, um, with other directors as a choreographer and in also in publicity. But uh, besides that, I have a dance company since, since uh, more than five years. With this company, I've created more than 30 shows that have been uh, tour touring all over the world. And one uh, of my last shows that uh, were, that you just saw the video, it's a show uh, that is called Le Val de Paris. It's a total um, immersive live show in virtual reality. And we just did uh, the, the premiere in Madrid. Uh, uh, it was uh, adapted avon premiere in Madrid in December. And we had 4,000 uh, people came to try this uh, new show. And it was for me very interesting because it's the first in completely immersive dance show in virtual reality that uh, it's been created. And also the, the fact of being able to do um, this show during pandemia uh, it was very uh, special because I had to do all the creation with all the difficulties of this moment we are living. But I'm happy that I could uh, stay creative and uh, live this um, experience uh, in this very special moment. Great, thank you very much, Blanca. Next, um, may I invite Tatiana to make a short introduction. Of course, thank you, Vivienne, um, and good evening, Hong Kong, um, and good afternoon to the people that are in France right now, like I am. So yeah, I'm Tatiana Videla dos Santos. 
I'm a game designer and artist based in Paris, France. Um, and for almost 10 years now, I've been designing and developing art games. So artistic video games that for most of them are meant to be played during exhibits. Um, so here you can see Contre Ciel. It's a game based on an artificial sky and a MIDI keyboard. Players are invited to interact with the framed sky by changing the weather, the night and day cycle, the season, the planet from which the sky is seen, depending on the music played on the keyboard. So it's basically providing a demiurge, a, a godlike experience of space traveling through music. But uh, as the rules of interaction are hidden from the players, they have to understand them. So Contre Ciel is also a sort of Rosetta Stone to explore. So for the past decade or so, I've made 24 playful experiences like this one. They're all part of my multimedia projects titled Meg Burned. And I've been lucky enough to exhibit all around the world on four different continents. Um, I've counted just before the panel starts. I've been part of 83 different exhibits and exhibited 97 of my works. So I'm close to the symbolic threshold of 100. And most of my works involve people touching the same objects, the same interfaces. And for some of my most experimental games, um, players even have to embrace each other. So yeah, definitely not something you want to play in the middle of a worldwide pandemic, uh, at least not a pandemic of an airborne virus. So yeah, the current situation is quite a challenge for me as the whole point of this type of works, uh, playful installations and alternative control games is to provide game experiences that are more physical and less digital. Um, my main goal is to bring the video game magic out of the screen and use digital technologies to re-enchant um, a tangible space. So for the past year, I had to come up with ways to keep on doing that uh, while complying with the COVID-related safety measures. Um, but yeah, I'm not one to flinch before creative challenges and difficult turns. So I actually found ways to keep on doing what I'm doing, uh, which is exploring uncharted territories of playfulness. And there are four main tracks I'm exploring, four main avenues of research. Um, two of them work on the assumption that I will be able to exhibit on site while complying with social distancing and mask wearing and so on. Um, the first one is involving intangible controllers, mainly motion capture and eye tracking devices. The second one is an exploration of foot operated games. Um, and the two others are about exploring the possibilities of playing such games remotely, else through streaming. For example, my last game, Le Sphinx, is a musical puzzle game played on a sort of LED sculpture with a metallophone. It's like a xylophone, but made out of metal. Um, but you can hypothetically play with any instruments that features at least two octaves, so a piano, a guitar, a violin, a cello uh, could work. And I'm trying to find solutions for players to play them from home while watching the installation, the sculpture that's right now at my place through a live stream. And um, the last one is an exploration of the idea of um, détournement. It's a French concept of rerouting, repurposing uh, a pre-existing element of culture to make them say something else. Um, it's close to culture jamming and parody in a sense. And in my case, it's all about hijacking common game interfaces like keyboards, mice, and game pads, or daily objects to turn them into game controllers by finding a playful way to use them. So I recently made a game involving chopsticks and joysticks, for instance. Um, and yeah, my whole goal with this is, well, first for people to be able to play at home, but also to instigate um, a, a certain 
um, a sense of wonder by inviting players to question their daily environment, see it in a different way. Um, I think this can be summed up by a quote from a French writer I really like. It's Raymond Queneau. Um, I want players to question their little spoons. So yeah, that's the gist of what I used to do before 2020 and how I'm facing the challenges raised by this unprecedented situation so far. <clears throat> Great, thank you very much, Tatiana. That was, a, that was that was a wonderful introduction. I will definitely come back to the topic of games uh, during our discussion. So next, I would like to invite um, Dr. Hong Kan to um, give a short introduction. Okay. Hello, everyone. I would like to say good morning and good evening to you all. Okay. So okay. So let's kick off my presentation, and then you just call me Hong Kan. And, and then this is my family. <laughs> so this is the time when I was around two and a half because actually I was not born in Hong Kong. I was born in Yunnan. <laughs> okay. It's a bit far away from Hong Kong and then I moved to Hong Kong when I was two and a half. And afterward I grew up, educated in Hong Kong and then afterward I developed my art school here. So then, okay, I think one of my Changing point uh, I'd like to share with you is the time when I was in Germany because I spent my one year over there. The, there's the center, it's the KM. And then when I was there, I learned there's a concept about creative collaboration. So when I was there, and then I learned a lot from my professors. And afterward, when I back to Hong Kong, I immediately I set up my research lab together with a bunch of people. Uh, actually, I'm the person who know nothing in this team. And then I invite so many interesting persons. They are like animator, 3D programmer, they are exhibitor, and then they are good in hardware making, and then some of them is fashion designer or just visual designer. So we work closely together, and after work, we create artwork. So this is some of my, okay, and then this is some of my artwork. I'd like to just really quick to go over it. This is some of my interactive CD-ROM work. And then afterward, we create some of our uh, interactive programming, integrated with the concept of Chinese characters, telling the multiple identities of traditional Chinese and simplified Chinese. Then afterward, we try to transform the identity issue to Chinese philosophical issue. So we try to use digital images and interactive work telling the story about Tao how Tao give birth to one telling the story about universe. And this is kind of my installation. And then afterward, I get into the place is the more spiritual because I met some people there from the Buddhist belief. And then I find meditation, mindfulness, contemplation can really strengthen up our ability, but at the same time can release our stress. So I pay more attention to see how interactive art can bring meditation or mindfulness thinking to the audience. So I've been doing some virtual reality work and then some AR presentation. And then afterward, I feel still something not really enough for me because I'm the person who lack of a lot of element. So afterward, I go to visit some different country, and then I would like to show you here. This is uh, my meditation work with uh, Hong Kong Temple. And then the thing I would like to show you is here. Then I keep visiting different countries, particularly in Mongolia, Tibet, and Yunnan, and also Nepal. And then I visit there and then doing some sketches, and then afterward, I transform those sketches through digital moving, digital moving images and interactive programming. Then I hope in the future I would like to show you more. Then afterward, if you still have time, we can go through some of my video. Yeah, thank you. Okay, <laughs> thank you very video, much, yeah. Hongkai. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll definitely have more questions uh, for you.
<clears throat> Great, thank you very much. Uh, I was, I was kind of excited when you were mentioning about the meditation and mindfulness, and, uh, and I had some questions like immediately I, in, in my mind, but I'll ask you um, in a bit. And, <laughs> and um, last but not least, so we have uh, Chris Chang on him to make an introduction. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, thank you, Hong Kong. Uh, hi, everyone. <clears throat> Uh, so, uh, I'm Chris Chung, I'm a media artist and I'm also a creative director and art artistic director in my studio. So, um, actually I play <coughs> quite a different role in uh, my artistic, um, artistic creation. So, this, the video showing is uh, from my team, Except. Uh, in the project of Except, we work a lot with uh, brandings. So, uh, we create immersive um, installation for brands and we create a unique experience when the audience came into the space so you can see that from the videos we create um, a, a we use different technology to to enhance the uh, immersive experience um, you can see that there's a few projects in in these videos some of them using producer mapping some of them using a uh, kind of um, 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 different technology in the, in the whole setup. So, um, this is a project from my another uh, art, art group called Exceed, um, which we have a different approach because working with commercial is quite different uh, with working with uh, um, art festival or museum. So, in the project of Exceed, we mainly work with artistic uh, commissions. So this is a project uh, called Cola AG, which we created a wearable device for people to realize how the future uh, is full of surveillance. Thank you for coming so to uh, the device is actually act as a museum audio guide. When the people entering the exhibition, they will put on the device, and then the people will start realize this device is keep tracking the people uh, movement. So uh, in this device, we have few different functions. The first one is uh, audio guide function, but we hacked the voice of Siri, and then to let the voice tell you different uh, art installation information. But we use a very sarcastic uh, tone to tell you different um, stories. You can see that there's a countdown clock as well. So it's a very unusual experience when you came into an exhibition. It will limit your time to visit the whole exhibition. And also the most important uh, is that the technology of tracking. So there's an eye beacon device. So that it allowed the, um, the device to know where are you uh, uh, standing, standing from. So when you walk around the space, the device will keep telling you to uh, move around. And also, it's given you a, a certain limitation or kind of awareness about the mo keep, keeping monitoring by the, by the, by the program. <clears throat> In our artistic commissions, uh, we, we work a lot with uh, kinetic sculpture as well. So this is the kinetic art series we created for. Uh, we also travel a lot uh, with this series to, to different uh, countries. So... Uh, this device will use uh, sound, uh, kinetic movement, and also uh, light to create a very interesting optical illusions. So back to some of my personal projects. Um, my personal pra practice is more uh, relied on um, Chinese philosophy. So I use a lot of traditional media, uh, or maybe use kind of future media to talk the tell the story. So this is the installation called No Longer Right, Mochiji. It's one of the installations using artificial intelligence to uh, do the machine learning from the traditional Chinese calli calligraphy. So uh, you can see that from the projection, you can see that those Chinese characters keep evolving because it keep, the machine keeps learning from the uh, previous uh, audience writing. But at a certain point, you will find that um, the Chinese character is st start uh, evolving to some kind of character human can't read. So it is more about the, the medium changes. It's also my practice in recent years 
telling the people that in the future, the medium is um, changing. And also, some of the traditional art form is disappearing. Just like the video showing, the character will sh fade out, and only the, the machine can realize what is the Chinese character. So uh, the installation setup is uh, recently uh, collected in Taiwan uh, Museum, uh, Taoyuan National Museum of Fine, Fine Arts. So if you have chance to go to Taiwan, you can have a look later. Another artwork I, uh, I, recent, I keep on working is uh, traditional uh, contemporary, contemporary ink painting. So this one is uh, using a very new technology, not a very new technology, actually the technology is already exists. Uh, I use a kind of magic ink which just disappear when the heat comes out. So you can see that from the videos. Um, this I will need a lot of time to experience because the transition is very, very slow. It takes around five or 10 minutes. You will see the whole abstract image. For example, the video is uh, speed up in, in a 20, uh, 20 times speed, speeding up. So it displayed a moon images from uh, Taiwan Taoyuan and also some landscape painting. Uh, will appear. It based on some of the photography I, I stood in the mountain and then to recreate a kind of um, fading in a sand uh, Chinese ink painting. Yeah. It's because I study uh, ink art when I back to back from Japan and then I want to use more analog media. So that's why I I start to learn experimental ink. And most interesting. Uh, things I learned from ink is the moment when the ink um, melts in the water or, or when the ink touches the paper, the ink will spread in the, in the paper. So I start to research on this kind of relationship between ink and paper and try to uh, use this technology to visualize my ideas. So I did a few of, uh, different setup. This is some kind of traditional Japanese setup with bonsai and another arrangement with bonsai, and also uh, traditional uh, appreciation of uh, scholar stones. The final hour I want to show is uh, using some kind of data, because in these few years, I also work a lot with uh, climate data. This is the installation. I, I did it in Hong Kong uh, Visual Arts Center. So you can see the, the uh, rising of the black spear is visualizing some kind of carbon emission data. And can, can you volume up some of the sound? Yes. The sound sh uh, showing is kind of um, noises from what we, uh, we left our carbon emission. Because when we travel, like when we taking travel, when we take the plane, we have some noises. So every tube is representing one kind of carbon emission noises. So um, I want to echo on some kind of climate issue in the future as well. So that's all for my sharing. Yep. <laughs> Great, thank you very much, Chris. So let's move on to um, the discussion part. Um, so Tatiana and um, Blanca, so when you, uh, you, you mentioned a little bit about um, how uh, 2020 has been like um, for both of you. And uh, now I would like to hear a little bit from uh, Hong Kong and uh, Chris, how 2020 has been like for you, especially the experience of the pandemic. How has it been, um, uh, how has it been affecting uh, your work? I think in particularly your, your thinking and creative process has it you know has anything changed at all <laughs> it's really uh, having a great impact because you know when we're working with space installation we need space and under the pandemic actually there's a lot of uh, social distancing policy we can't travel or we can't really making a physical installation so um, in 2020 uh, we did in my company project, we did a lot uh, adaptation or maybe uh, changes in the whole um, artwork presentation. For example, we did some kind of uh, virtual reality installation, just like Blanker did a VR as well. Um, we use a lot of uh, this kind of virtual uh, 
we are glasses to, to create a new, new uh, adaptation. Um, I think this kind of technology will, will change the whole perception from the audience. Yeah, I believe everyone, uh, everyone of, of us will deal with this kind of changes as well. Yeah. Hmm. How has it been like for you, Hong Kong? Okay. Uh, surprisingly, because I think uh, this the pandemic issue uh, really does affect us a lot. Yeah. And then surprisingly, I, I, I spend more time to, to treasure life. <laughs> because I think life is just uh, can easy to be passed away. So I treasure more my family and then also because I just have a newborn baby and then I spend most of my time with my wife, my family and my baby. But it doesn't mean I do my artwork less. That's why I say surprise. Because the more I treasure my time with my family, in, in other words, I even more work hard with my artwork. So surprisingly, uh, my, the number of my artwork is getting more in-depth and then more, how to say that, it's like more, more spread out. And then what, what, what the meaning in terms of spread out is uh, I work closely with different kinds of people. Hmm. Yeah, because uh, we have uh, so many meetings, Zoom meetings, and then sometimes face-to-face. -face, and then we try to arrange a really good division of labors. Yeah, so even though we have one art subject, in the past, maybe one project, maybe uh, we spend two or three person to take up one subject, uh, one project. But right now, we will have a 10 to 15 members work together just only for one art project. So we feel happy to spend more time with our teammates. And then even though my, our, art, our artwork is even more in depth. So that's why I, I would like to share with you surprise, surprise, and surprise. Okay. <laughs> That sounds quite positive. And, yeah. uh, uh, and what about you, Blanca and Tatiana? Do you think the changes that you have experienced or the new things that you have, uh, you, you have done in 2020, they will remain, they will stay, and um, there's no going back to the pre-COVID period? Um, Tatiana, Blanca, uh, feel free. Yeah, sure. I, I just didn't know when to intervene, uh, but I will start. Um, yeah, I would say, too, that uh, to some degree, I had a more in-depth understanding of some of my work because basically my approach was to take each stake, each avenue of research I usually address through my works and tackle them separately. So, for, um, yeah, instead of making one work where all my intention, intentions of experience converged, I treated them through different ways. So for example, when it comes to instigating playfulness and creativity into players, I started making a lot of workshops and game jams that invite people to explore the concept of detournement, hijacking, let's say, by questioning their way to well-known environment. Instead of putting players in one of my installation so they can experiment with the system I designed, I'm trying to empower people by inviting them to look for a playful potential in their daily environment. And this is clearly made possible by the fact that people suddenly got more time to spend at home and looking for ways to reconnect. And this initiative started a community of creators and players that for some of them, I would have never met at on-site event. And I'll just end on one thing. I don't want to get uh, into two personal stories, but I had some messages following the jams and, and the workshops that really touched me um, of people telling me that this practice, this playful state of mind, was kind of life-changing for them. And yeah, that's really moving and actually much more than seeing players having a fun time, which is, of course, really nice too. But yeah, inspiring people, that's something else that's on another level, and that was made possible by the current situation. Thanks, and I, Blanca? For, for, for the, for the um, show business, uh, for, for the uh, performing arts, uh, it's been a total drama, because uh, all work is on a stage, it's with public, and it's uh, traveling all over the world, sharing what we do, uh, so I think for, and I talk in the name of all the performing arts in the world, this has been a, 
a terrible year. Um, we could not travel anymore. All the shows had been canceled, and all theaters, practically all over the world, have been closed. So it's it's been very very sad for us. The dancers cannot dance. The singers cannot sing. People. Um, through the first months of uh, close uh, time, when we were all at home because we couldn't go out, uh, many artists started to share their work uh, on streaming and sharing videos of performance. And um, in the theater in Madrid, we opened like a fourth stage that was a virtual stage where uh, the artists could share creations that they were doing at home. So we were trying to invite new ways of being with the public, but of course, uh, nothing replaced really uh, the emotion and the feeling of a live show. And then uh, I was working in my new show that was able but through a, a virtual show. <laughs> so in this sense, uh, those months I was uh, at home, I could still work because we were the, doing the music, we were developing the, the, the script and I was working with the animation. So we could, in a way we could keep on working in the creation on those months because we were at home, but we, we could co communicate. And then it came the after, uh, in the month of May, when things were looking like they were getting better, uh, we had the chance to open the theater in Madrid. I think the government of Madrid uh, have decided since then that culture is a basic thing. So in Madrid, the museums and theaters and the cinema have been open since May up to today. And this was a very uh, great thing for me as a director of the theater because I could continue to have the artists in the theater and to have open shows. We are running the theater 50% um, uh, only in the public, but uh, every, of course we have all the security measures. Everybody's with masks, uh, they, they take temperature, everybody wash hands. Uh, all the artists have to do tests, but but we are open. We are open, and this is uh, one of the uh, probably only theaters in the world that have been continuously uh, giving performance every night. And uh, for many artists, this was like a, like a, 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 some oxygen, so they could come and create and be in touch with the public. Uh, now the situation is getting again a little bit difficult. So I don't know what's going to happen in the next months, but for the moment we still uh, able to give this little space of oxygen for artists all over the world that when they can come to the theater, they can perform. But it's been a really complicated moment. And I was very happy that I could do the premiere of my show. <laughs> uh, this was a very, very beautiful moment. But I think every night when I open the curtain, I feel like uh, I'm a, I am very lucky uh, that I can open the curtain of the theater every night. Great, thank you very much, Blanca. Well, it's definitely been a challenging year for, for everyone, but it also sounds like every, um, a lot of artists have still managed to keep creating and coming up with new ideas, producing new works. Um, I think one of the great, one of the biggest, um, well, impact that we have, that we felt uh, over the past year is the uh, heavy reliance of technology and this kind of, um, uh, 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 Zoom conversation has been going on. It's already like the new normal. And um, so I, I, I'm just curious of how this is going to impact our lives further in, 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 the, in the years to come, especially to the idea, to, to art and the idea of art. How, um, uh, when we were at the backstage um, discussing well, preparing for the for the for the talk, uh, we were talking about how um, in some countries people have started already uh, implanting a chip uh, in our body, and if this is going to become the new norm, how would that affect um, art, uh, the the development of art, and the and the, and the idea of art? Um, so maybe Chris, you have some ideas. <laughs> yeah. Well, we. Yeah, we discussed a little bit on the uh, wearable, wearable technology because I believe that in the upcoming, not, not far, I think, uh, in the upcoming two or three years, we will already seeing this kind of um, chips implanting into a new, new network, a new system. So that, that, what that means is because when you, um, <clears throat> we are currently still using cell phone to communicate, 
but at the, a few, in the future, I believe that the message will directly implant into your mind or you can perceive the message instant. So that will be having a lot of issue when we deal with uh, media art. So uh, it totally speed up the whole, um, whole um, uh, medium changes uh, speed. So um, you will see that uh, many traditional art form will be uh, fading away or maybe we have to think about a new aesthetic to, um, to understand or to experience art. So that's, I think, the challenge we will, we will see in the in upcoming futures. Yeah. Hong Kong, what do you think? Yeah. Um, I, I hope, yeah, I'm sure as what Chris mentioned, uh, these kinds of technology, I'm sure it already exists, and then we'll be getting common and easier user friendly in the future, Ian. That's no doubt. And I hope uh, there's a two direction in my mind. First of all, is, uh, they can be, actually coins have two faces. Yeah. So I hope, I really hope positive thinking um, can be, the first direction can be like uh, function as the uh, emotional healing. Yeah. So uh, if we, the people with some emotional problem or they have some kinds of uh, uh, negative anxiety issue and then that kind of chip can can really and active their positive energy somehow yeah that's the one direction uh another direction i'd like i hope in the future uh when i'm talking about emotional healing and then another part i want to say something is about the visual appreciation yeah in the future because i'm working closely with some with the people they are visually empire that means they somehow they can't really see or they hardly see i hope this kind of trip in the future can bring them to visualize something yeah, mm -hmm. in the world. Might be even better, I don't know, but definitely one coin have two faces. Yeah, I, 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 hope, I hope this positive direction will be going on. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Because when I was first, when I, when I first, uh, or, or when I was thinking about the question, I was thinking, you know, how, um, uh, I mean, just like what Chris mentioned, uh, the disappearance of medium, and if we can, you know, if we can receive the signals, you know, directly without processing, you know, through our, uh, our vision or our hearing, then you know, how would that change um, the way we. Uh, we receive messages and the way we perceive um, art. Um, so how about our friends in uh, France at, at the moment? Uh, Blanca, Tatiana, have you thought about that? Um, I think yeah. they, sorry. No, 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 no go please, on, please go ahead. <laughs> um, I think the technology definitely is changing very, very fast. And uh, I think with the pandemic, uh, it's been accelerating this change. The, the people is getting more and more used to, and the more things become easy, the more we communicate. And I think there is an evolution, is for sure. Uh, I want to be positive and imagine that uh, as the way we are artists can use technology for, so for creating, I think there is many good things about the development of technology. But I also believe that the, uh, the basic things, like, uh, for example, uh, performing arts, probably, we will appreciate even more. I think everything that will be not technology also will be very uh, appreciated. I think uh, it will be always beautiful just to look at the picture or listen to uh, real music or see some beautiful dancers. So I think technology is good, but uh, life things and reality is also very good. Hmm. Okay, Tatiana? Yeah, uh, well, like uh, previously said, it's like most things in life, a two-sided coin. Um, to talk about specifically relying too much on technologies uh, and the question of freedom that you raised, I think something that we not so much talk about is the trap of falling into ease, into passivity, by counting on technologies to do a lot, if not everything, for us, you know, uh, we expect technologies to entertain us, inform us, and let's take the specific case of 
playfulness, which is one I, I know, at least a case I know, um, you know, you will buy a game and expect it to entertain you, and it somehow shifts the responsibility of entertainment. Um, so when we talk about being deprived of some freedom by technology, we often, often think about someone else tracking us, etc. But actually uh, being robbed from our own responsibility is also uh, a form for me of uh, freedom, de well, de deprivation. So yeah, I think technologies, as long as they remain a tool, a mean, and not an end, it's okay. The moment it becomes an end, it becomes a problem. This is how I see it. Great. So you mean the um, I, I, referring to the we we are surrendering ourselves to to technology rather than harnessing. Um, yeah. Great. Yeah. And um, so does it mean that um, uh, for um, for you or uh, I mean everyone uh, on this on this panel that um, traditional art form will still exist no matter how um, technology evolves. I do. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, <laughs> when we look back to the technology advancement, it, we always improving our technology, but still we can see that the uh, way of seeing art is changing. For example, or maybe just give a very um, uh, uh, easy example. For example, when we look back to the um, text or calligraphy arts, back in the, like, many, many uh, years ago, they create th those texts in the caves. So when, when, when the people doing that kind of uh, literature art or kind of uh, pic 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 pictogram on the cave, they might be not perceived as art or they just uh, perceive it as kind of decoration or maybe kind of, um, kind of uh, 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 diary for, the, for, for, for recognize the, the daily practice. But when we look back after many, many years ago, or many years after, we, our technology changes, and also uh, this, the, the, the this different medium is changing. We look back in the traditional art form, this kind of uh, practice is very uh, uh, different when we uh, comparing it to those uh, creation at that time. So I believe that traditional art form will not fade away, but it's changing the perspective of the future people to look back into the art creations. Hmm. Anything to add, Hong Kong? Yeah, actually, I share my uh, point of view like uh, Chris, and then um, I think everything uh, is include uh, the concept of evolution. So there's no doubt everything can be fade out, and then afterward, new coming object or coming uh, new technology. Uh, there's no doubt, definitely. And it, but I think something is uh, interesting is. Um, uh, the meaning or the definition of the, the object will be different. But the, the, their spirit and then their existing will be, actually will be there. Uh, just like because of Chris, I appreciate Chris's work is uh, dealing with uh, Chinese calligraphy, and then sometimes also dealing with Chinese calligraphy. So I'm sure the way we see calligraphy at this moment is totally different from our family, or my father and my mom. Yeah, but we are dealing with same calligraphy. But the meaning and then the way how we see or how we handle totally different. So the spirit is already there, even though the perspective is different. Yeah, that's my, that's my thinking. Yeah. Yes. Great. I think, uh, I think that that uh, there is many new ways of storytelling thanks to also the new technologies. The, these all these new ways of inventing uh, stories didn't exist before, but I don't think that they will make disappear. Uh, traditional art uh, art forms. I think it's just yes, a compliment, and it's great that we have all these new technologies to invite new ways of of creation, which is what we love also. Mm. Yeah. So for those who are watching this live, uh, you can send us questions, um, and when we enter the Q and A session, that we're going we'll try to answer your questions. Um, so back to the discussion. Uh, we, we, uh, we, we talked a little bit about games earlier, and I think the 
the, um, I think the idea of games and the importance of games, it has, um, I, I, I'm not, quite, not sure about how things are uh, in, in France or other places, but here uh, it's been portrayed as um, something, it, it has a negative image. Um, uh, parents would be telling their kids, oh, stop playing games, it's bad for you, and you know, go back to study, do your homework. But then games are actually very important in terms of the, like what Tatiana mentioned, the, uh, the importance of playfulness and uh, to, 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 inspire, to inspire us uh, uh, creative thinking. So um, Hong Kang, I know you have a, a, a little bit to say about this. Can you elaborate a bit more? Okay. Maybe I'll go first, yeah, and then after what you Okay. Uh, actually, <laughs> uh, I think games is a way to, for all of us to communicate ourselves. And normally when we are looking at artwork, we are communicating with the artists. <laughs> yeah, and then we are communicating with art projects. But game is really spiritual. It's pretty, they, they provide the major experience for us to understand ourselves. Okay, like I, I, I particularly like the artwork in uh, we're showing actually during the pandemic, there's a video projection on the ceiling and then project the images on the floor and then the kid they playing around. And then I particularly like that kind of work. And then uh, recently I'm also examined this kind of possibility, um, try to provide a game or to create some interesting interactive games, allow the audience to understand themselves a, a bit. Like, uh, there, I've got some work is uh, uh, two years ago in Asian society, and then there's a game is that allow the, the, the audience to write heart, represent love, yeah. Mm. The Chinese heart represent English mm. love. Mm. And then there's a machine, it's operate uh, automatically uh, telling you how to write heart, represent love. But everyone, when they're holding the electronic pen, and then they have their kinds of interpretation, and then they have their own experience. So once they are controlling the machine to write the heart through Chinese ink and Chinese brush, and then it somehow they struggle with their body together with the machine. And afterward, the outcome is totally messy, but it's their heart. And then once they share the experience, and then they're telling how they struggle with the machine, and then they feel happiness. They, actually, they share their happiness. So I think uh, the, the whole experience is not about how they communicate with the artwork. It's uh, more about how they learn themselves through the artwork. And then there's another issue I'm working now is that I also consult with the people downstairs about the, the language of France. Yeah, because I've, uh, recently I developed a series of artwork is the, together with English, France, and German, and then these kinds of interactive Chinese and English and French characters. Those characters actually is flying in front of the people, they feel sad. And then I will create three different kinds of games according to their level of emotion. Once they learn it, and then they feel released. So I think that is the thing I personally really touch on it. And now I hope in the future can can explore more. Maybe consult with Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Not consult, Your but it's a very good point. Uh, Hong Kong uh, mentioned. I also see game as a metaphor of life because uh, there's a very famous game uh, when I was studying media art. This game of life. So uh, it's really basic, telling the people about the fundamental of uh, game design. There are four rules or five rules. Four rules. But these four rules are already telling you that how to simulate life. So uh, in the, the theory of uh, game of life, I can see that even it can apply in our human uh, evolution, uh, how we can create human. So uh, yeah, so I, I, can, I totally agree with uh, Hong Kong. Game somehow is telling uh, some kind of life generation as well, yes. I think there's also a lot of um, uh, playfulness, playfulness in uh, in in the video works uh, in the vid videos of uh, that Blanca showed us the performances, um, like the one that we saw with the um, the, the 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 dance. Uh, the dance bit, uh, and then with the um, the motion capture 
and then you see another clip that you know the the, the characters and the um, masks that that was also quite a, a strong element of playfulness in there. Yes, the the my last show that I created in Paris, um, it's called Le Bal de Paris, and it's uh, the idea is to create a very joyful uh, show where the public it's part of the action. So when when they come inside, uh, they have all like the the, the headset. They have captors in the hands and also in their feet, uh, and they have a backpack with a computer so that they could see themselves inside. And when they go into, into the virtual world, they, they are part of the show and all the of the history with the dancers. The dancers are the main role, but the public is part totally of the story, which is uh, very fun for them because they, they find themselves in a virtual world with an avatar together with the dancers and they become part of the story. And also there is a lot of dance. They have the chance to dance with each other. So when we did the, the album premiere in Madrid, um, there came many kids came to the, to the show and they were having much fun because they became dancers, they, they became actors, they became uh, a different person, but at the same time they could play with the, some families came together, they could play with the, with the family, they could play with all the kids, they can play with the dancers. And I, I really enjoy very much to create the show thanks to technology where people can be really part of, uh, of a big event. A big, it's almost like a party, the show, and I love this joyfulness. We all feel in a way like kids in this play. Great, so playfulness and harnessing technology will be kind of like the theme for um, artistic creations in the in, in, in the coming future. Um, so just uh, one more question. I, I have been, actually I heard it from somewhere else that um, some young artists or uh, artists who are still in, uh, in, in art school, or it may be even younger, like teenagers who are considering oh, whether they should go to art school. Do you think it's necessary for them to learn coding? at our schools? I think it's compulsory right now, right? It's very many, many STEM program in Hong Kong. It's getting more youngster to learn about electronics. I think in terms of coding, I, I think in, in our art, artist practice, maybe me or also Hong Kong, we do, for, we do have a lot of coding in our, in our artworks. But this is not really necessary to to create digital art or media art. Sometimes we can use basic, um, basic medium or mixed medium. We are, can also create uh, interesting ideas or create digital art. So I, I, do, I do think um, coding is not necessary, but this is one kind of tools we, we can use. Yes, just like the brush, one kind of brush. The new brush? Yes. Okay. Hong Kong, do you agree? Yeah, I would like to share uh, my points of view. Actually, similar to Chris a bit, but I would like to have a kind of the, the terms. It's not about the balancing. It doesn't mean you spend lots of time in coding, and then you can spend lesser in another subject. If we do it in this way, our artwork definitely without any context. So the, balan the, the balancing means the more you study coding, the more you have to understand your society, the more you enrich yourself to understand more coding, the more you under, uh, understand about our history and our culture. <laughs> then afterward, it will be win-win. <laughs> 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 yeah, okay, we have less than, uh, less than two minute, minutes left. Um, so anything else to add, Tatiana or uh, Blanca? I would, like, I would like to say that I think that it will be very, very useful for everybody to learn coding. <laughs> and if they can learn in the schools, I think it's not a bad idea because uh, it's very useful for me. So thinking of what the world in the future will be, I think coding should be part of the, of the, 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 the studies that kids should have from, from very little because it will help them a lot, I think. Great. And Tatiana, we have, okay, 45 seconds. 
Uh, in five seconds, yeah, cool. Uh, I love coding, great. Yeah, it's five seconds. I mean, what do you want me to say in five seconds? <laughs> no, because I'm looking at the countdown clock and it tells me. Yeah, you of know, course, no problem. But yeah, Sorry. coding is great. People should do it. Excellent. Um, yeah, because I, I saw I saw the, uh, the the other day at a cafe and they were promoting a course teaching kids uh, aged between uh, three and five to learn coding, uh, and, and that was a shocker to me. So that, yeah, three to five. So that's why I want to ask you know our artists here um, to see you know if that would be uh, the the future. But anyway, and well, but thank you so much for joining us this um, this evening and uh, and the. the this afternoon, and uh, I hope you all have a wonderful, uh, have a great time, and get something you know out of this discussion. And um, and this is the um, the this is the uh, coming to a, a conclusion of the the night of ideas. And uh, so for those who are watching, thank you very much, and we wish you um, good health and um, and be, and stay happy. Thank you. Goodbye. Stay happy. Thank you.